Hi everybody, Carl here. Just a quick uh, message before we get started with a really, really great interview today uh, with William Falk. Uh, we had a couple of technical issues, so for about the first two thirds, there will be no video of me. Whether or not uh, that is a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave that up to you to decide. And also, uh, there's another little break, so I'll come back and comment on what's missing there. It was a bunch of little technical flubs, but that will hopefully not det uh, distract from what is really, really an insightful uh, view of a career that has spanned four decades. So with that being said, enjoy the show. We've had many impressive people here on the show today, people who had careers that uh, really changed the industry, but very few of them have had the influence of our of today's guest and the longevity <laughs> in the industry of today's guest, oh because God. this man is not retired. He hasn't stepped down. He's still in the thick of it to this day. Welcome to the show, William Folk. Hi. Welcome. Glad to be here. Excellent. Excellent. And hopefully I pronounced the last name properly. I do you now. Did. Yeah. You did. Well, you're in Germany. You should be able to pronounce the name. I, that, yeah. That's true. But, you know, you never know. It's, you know, the, the Frankenstein, Frankenstein thing, you know. Oh, my God. So. <laughs> I, 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 I actually took a class at Mel Gibson. Uh, Mel Brooks once. Mel Brooks, yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yes. Yeah, yes. That's a class. I, uh, I, I've div I teach at a university nowadays. I've come up with some weird classes. But that one is – that I it was a, uh, Nutrition and exercise, a couple of weeks, uh, weekends, and uh, one some weeknights. Uh, basically learning how to eat healthier exercise. Mel Brooks attended it with his wife at the time, Anne Bancroft. And Paul Mazursky, the director, was there as well. 30 people in the class, very intimate, very funny, actually. Very oh, cool. my he was, God. He was just in the class. He was just in the class, and it worked because this class was in 1994. Obviously, he survived. So whatever he, <laughs> whatever he learned there worked really well. Uh, and, uh, and coincidentally, uh, my dad actually worked with him briefly in the early 1950s on Show of Shows as a writer. So they wow. kind of, he kind of knew my dad that much, but he knew my dad. He didn't know him that much, but he did remember him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. – Okay. Uh, normally, I start all the interviews by asking people about their educational background. You should. Now I do have to make a short tangent. Your dad was a writer on Show of Shows, Sid Caesar yeah, Show well, of my Shows. Dad, my dad, yeah, yeah, my dad was a writer early in his career, and he moved into the family business, which is parking car, parking car garages, probably because he had a family support and writing was hard, you know. But uh, <laughs> oh, and here's the only funny thing about my father. My father hated country music, but he wrote a song. That was a comedy song in the 50s called I'm Bu He's Building a Bar in the Back of His Car and He's Driving Himself to Drink. Well, the, the uh, I irony of that is that song became a sort of minor country music classic, even though he never recorded it as a music thing. It's on the Internet Archive. It was recorded as just a funny, you know, sort of like uh, Dr. Demento types, you know, you know, do, 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 you know. And uh, so that's that's humorous. But he he briefly did that. He. Uh, was involved in a magazine called Sick or something like that. I don't know, like a competitor to Mad Magazine. But he mm. had – my understanding is he had to get a real income. And my grandfather had owned, owned a parking garage in Manhattan. So he went to work for my grandfather. Um, curiously enough, my grandfather was one of these people that just before the Great Depression of America didn't trust banks and had cash. So he, they survived the uh, Great Depression very nicely. My mom and my grandfather did. Um, so he went into that business, and that's why he didn't stay in comedy writing. Uh, I'm sure he regretted it. And it's actually something I think about a lot when um, I've had tough times. And rather than just bailing out, I've sort of stuck with it because I remember that my dad had regret for not staying in comic writing. And um, I hope I've had some spinoff in terms of the funny stuff I've done in the past. Uh, you know, So we'll see. Okay, you want to talk about education? Should I talk about my yes, education? Yes, yes. I'm sorry. I just needed to get that out there, but that's fascinating. Sorry, I, I love watching old clips of uh, of Sid Caesar's. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. My, my dad knew a lot of crazy people. So anyway, all right. So um, okay, I your to, education. Uh, so I, I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is a Ivy League school uh, for my undergrad, and I I got in as an English major because my verbal SATs were higher. I, took started out like a journalism class but i went into physics and i graduated with a degree in physics and astronomy 
my most notable event at University of Pennsylvania is I got to work on the neutrino experiment in the home state gold mine. So when people on Facebook say, write something that no one will believe, I say, I spent a summer a mile underneath the surface of the planet Earth because I did. I worked on the uh, famous neutrino experiment with Davis and Landy. Davis did the um, solar neutrino thing, uh, detecting solar neutrinos, and he actually won the Nobel Prize for it. Landy, who was the person I was working with at Penn, was basically trying to build a neutrino telescope to determine if they could detect a supernova event. Um, I was picked because I was a clever undergrad, but also because I was the largest undergrad. This is my theory. Someone had to be actually put mine cars through the tunnel. And uh, those mine cars later on um, played a role in this game, uh, Return to Zork, because I we put in a mine car puzzle because I had been in the gold mine. So that was my undergraduate degree. Then I went to um, University of Maryland for a year for the graduate physics program. And that's how I got my career start. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then I did graduate work at University of New Hampshire in computer engineering and physics. Um, so I got introduced to computers at Penn because my senior year, one of my uh, dorm mates, now I had taken courses with like Fortran and, P and PL1 uh, and, you know, just the usual thing they make you take back then, punch cards or, you know, this is mid 70s. But uh, someone in the dorm uh, was uh, a computer scientist and he had a class on microcomputers. They wanted more people in the class to do the class at the Moore College of Electrical Engineering, which, by the way, is where ENIAC was invented, the first digital computer, electronic digital computer. Um, now, so now, quick I took question. I, just to put this in chronologically, you said mid '70s. So you're taking a microcomputer class in what year? In Seventy in '78, I believe. Wow. I think it was. Seventy-eight. No, '79. '79. '79. '79. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, no, 78 because it was before I anyway, 78 because it was before I graduated in 79, 79. I graduated in June of 79. So it had to be the fall 78. So they had Kromenko microcomputers with graphics cards. And so my project for the class was a lunar lander game because we all love the Atari lunar lander and all that. Uh, and, you know, I have a physics degree. I know how, I know how to write a lunar lander game. I know the math. Um, and uh, and then. So that's why I did at Penn. And then I went to Maryland thinking I'm going to get a PhD in astrophysics. I'm going to be working at NASA. My dad actually knew someone at, at the Goddard Space Center in Maryland. So that's why I went to Maryland. Um, and this is what happened. So we're fast forward to December of 1979. I'm looking for something to do during the break. And I see a sign that says, would you like to play test games? We need play testers, something like that at Avalon Hill. And this is for computer games. So I take the job and I start playtesting games, Avalon Hill's first computer games, B1 Nuclear Bomber, Nuke War, Lords of Karma. Most of these games were basically, Avalon Hill's first games were basically mainframe games that were converted to basic and launched on computers like the TR-80 Model 1 and the Apple II and the Commodore PET. I saw these games and I liked them. Uh, it was fun testing them. I even tested Chris Crawford's Tanktics, which was a board game that sh that you used that used the board game, but it was a computer game. And Chris Crawford also wrote Legionnaire, which was a fantastic Atari game. I decided that, uh, you know, I, I was enthralled at Penn with a game on the Commodore Pet called Star Trek, the original Star Trek, the one that had the uh, two grids, one of a larger map and a smaller map, and you'd fire photon torpedoes, you'd fire phasers. Um, that game, the, the classic Star Trek game on the Commodore PET, the chick lick keyboard. I love that game. So when I got to, um, you know, I started doing stuff for Avalon Hill and I'm in grad school. I decided it would be nice to write a game that had graphics. Uh, I also got an Atari 800 through Avalon Hill, which cost me with all the stuff, $1,300 in 1980 money, which was a lot of money. Wow. But it came out of my, you know, it, they did it for me. Um, anyway, I had been enthralled with a uh, TV series called, uh, an animated series called Star Blazers, otherwise known as Spaceship Yamamoto in Japan, an anime sort of series about how they resurrect the Yamamoto battleship and they fight against aliens who are invading Earth. I decided it would be fun to build a Star Trek-like game, but to have it be much more complicated, to have the ability to have multiple ships, planets and bases, and you could actually take turns as a team playing the game, you know, controlling ships, or you just play multiple ship scenarios. You control the scenario. I also had taken, started taking AI classes, 
I knew, well, that's an, that'll come later. But anyway, the point is I, I had some ideas and I wrote this game in 1980 and Avalon Hill published it. This leads to when people say to me, what is the biggest mistake of your career? The big, biggest mistake is that I wrote three games for Avalon Hill. They were like the first three games I ever written and Avalon Hill published them and I made money on them. Partly because of my bro brother, the uh, law professor, he convinced, uh, he wrote a deal with Avalon Hill where I would get X dollars per product shipped. That was it. Simple royalty deal. A lot of people don't do that. They get percentage of profit. And if, since you were in the movie business, you know there's no such thing as net profit. You were in the film mm -hmm. distribution business. So anyway, I, I, I did um, Conflict 2500. And then I got very ambitious. By then, I was at University of Hampshire taking computer engineering, computer graphics courses, graduate courses, uh, as well as my astrophysics classes. And I decided to build a 3D game uh, where you basically wander around a spaceship fighting, uh, attacking robots. And at this time, Alien had come out. So I decided to be two ways to win the game. One would be to wipe out all the robots who are attacking you. The other way would be to set the ship on self-destruct find the escape pod and get out of there. This game was a wireframe 3D maze crawler. And I had seen an algorithm that allowed you to generate mazes randomly. So the whole layout of the game was randomly generated. Um, mm. You had four floors of some X by X grid of rooms. You had rooms, you had hallways, you had doors, you had weapons that you could pick up. You had health packs that you could pick up. Um, you fire at the robots, there's elevators, and you could set the ship on self-destruct and the timer would start counting, just like in the movie Alien, you get to a pod and you could escape. So I wrote that game. But then, fortuitously, uh, I was working at a video store in New Hampshire with a fellow named uh, Frank Kelly, and he had been in the Navy, and he had done on the Atari 100 a crude radar display, and it got us convinced that we could do an air traffic control game. We did a game called Controller. He helped me, he was an advisor. And Controller was an air traffic control game that Avalon Hill produced and possibly the best box art of any game I've ever done. We were working on that when Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controller. So it was a hot topic. And we made good money on that game right off the bat. Um, this is the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life, though, the, well, career-wise. I had done these three games for Avalon Hill. Everything I wrote was published. These games were basic in assembly language. I mean, for example, Voyager, which had the 3D wireframe, we had an assembly language routine to draw vectors on the TR-80 and the Commodore PET, which wasn't really uh, that type of machine. Why did I stop doing that? Why did I feel I needed a job? Well, partly was the fact that I went to a fancy college and, you know, there's a little bit of pressure there. You know, you went to a really expensive school at the time and it was one tenth the price it is now, but still that was money. And um, so uh, I was trying to, I had done a, 3D graphics package, by then I was using a language called FORTH, F-O-R-T-H, which is a really strange reverse Polish notation language with a lot of power. It was almost like an operating system into itself. I did a, a turtle graphics package for the Atari computer that Atari sold. Got to meet a lot of people at MIT. Got to hang out with Marvin Minsky and Seymour Paparet and then and Brown, hang out with Andreas Van Dam, because I was doing all these cool graphics things on these microcomputers. Uh, so I sold the graphics package for Atari, uh, and I, then I did a 3D wireframe package for a company called Valpar International, which had nothing to do with my next job. I actually tried to sell the 3D package to Epson. Epson had a computer called the QX10 that had a lot of stuff written in forth on it. So I tried to sell the 3D package to Epson at some conference in Boston. They said, you got to talk to these guys in California called Rising Star. They are working on something called Valdox, which has nothing to do with Valpar. So I get hired. Um, I'm in grad school, mind you, and I go to uh, the folks at um, Rising Star and I say, well, I'm in grad school. You know, if you want me to work for you full time, you have to pay me X. And they said, sure, we'll pay you. Little did I know what was going to happen, but it was a very interesting thing. I took the job at uh, Rising Star. So I, I left. I, I left. New Hampshire. I have the equivalent of a master's degree. They say I have a master's. I never got the paper. Um, went to work for Rising Star on the word processor and eventually a CAD CAM program called Valdraw, which was probably the most insane shove a lot of code into a small space uh, thing. But going back to Avalon Hill, that co controller game sold for $25. And that was like 45, 48 kilobytes of code, mostly basic with some assembly language depending on the machine. Um, 
that's insane when you think about today. That's like $72, $73 for a, a, an air traffic control game. You can look it up. You can even play it on the Internet Archive. It's hard. You're basically controlling different planes. You have 747s, you have a private jet, and you have a, a prop Cessna, and they all have different characteristics. I had the physics degree, so I knew how they, how long they would take to turn, how fast they could climb and descend. Um, you had to get them all lined up on the runway and landed. It was a um, pretty cool game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, it's amazing that the stuff sold that much. So I'm at Rising Star. Uh, good quick about question uh, before we move on from Avalon Hill. Yes, I yes. do have to ask now Avalon Hill in this time period, 80, 81, uh, like you said, the, the main platforms are um, uh, basically the tech space machines like the trash 80 and the pet and, I'm doing uh, graphics. and the Apple II. I'm doing all graphics games for those machines. Yeah. yeah. Now, are you doing all the ports yourself or is yes. that being sub licensed? Yes. Okay. So Voyager 1, but here's the story. Voyager 1, 3D wireframe, uh, TRS-80, TRS-80 Coco, Atari 800-400, Apple II, IBM PC, Commodore PET, right? Uh, later on, I found out they did get it ported to some Japanese computers, but I wasn't aware of it and never heard of it and never got royalties on that. So I don't know what mm. happened there. Controller was more limited because it really banged on the hardware. It was basically Atari 800-400 and the Apple II. On the Apple II, we did something where it was an optional thing where we, every um, uh, 60 of a second, we switched between two displays. So on the Apple II, we were actually had an option of a flickering display where the graphics was in a different plane than the actual text. Very cool, but very few people wanted to run it that way because it just drove you crazy in your eyes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Controller was probably the, the most quickest profitable thing I ever did. I think we wrote the game in a month. And it's it's a good game. You know, Voyager was interesting because you know, it's sort of like a real-time wireframe maze crawler, first-person shooter. Uh, and we'll get back to that. There's a game I do later on in my career that's really basically a, an update of that in a different domain. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and Avalon Hill was interesting. Avalon Hill is a business, was very vertically integrated. We would get resistance from computer stores at the time, 8081, 82, for having boxes because back then, Games shipped in baggies, plastic bags that they would hang on pegs at stores. But Avalon Hill was vertically integrated. They owned Monarch Printing. So those board games they did, and remember, this is a company was founded, founded in the 50s. Those board games, they did everything. They were so vertically integrated that they could do games like um, The Longest Day, the game about the DD invasion with tens of thousands of pieces and just insanity. They could do anything they wanted. It should be noted that when I went to University of New Hampshire, uh, the folks in the computer science department there had built multiplayer games on their mainframe, which was a Deck 10. So I told Avalon Hill at one point, we should take Squad Leader, which was the, their sort of squad action in World War II game, and we should build World War II online. We should take mainframes, get the game running on the mainframe as, this, as the keeper of the uh, game, but have programs on the Apple II and the TRS-80 that did the display themselves that the mainframe wouldn't be burdened and they looked at me like i was from mars because it was like ridiculous idea to begin with to do that in the early 80s with <laughs> dial up with 300 board modems but it was it an actual thing i i talked about you know um like i said i probably should have stayed as an independent gamer i would have been where sid meyer is and all those guys that would have been a lot more fun but i felt the need to um continue on now as far as education i didn't mention this Penn is unique in that even though I had a, a degree in physics and astronomy, they made me take a full liberal arts load as well. That was important because I learned how to write reasonably well. And the way I learned was I had a professor in a Shakespeare course take every term paper I wrote that was crappy and just tear it up in my face. <laughs> and remember, these are days before word processors, so I had to retype it, which is why I I dated girls who could type. Sorry, that's true. But anyway, um, but uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I also think on the pen that relates to my life is I was on the cycling team. I was on the, you know, I'd like to, I raced bicycles. It was a, it was a, a fun time. I loved being there. Um, so, um, so no, I did no, no, sorry, oh. one more question about Avalon Hill, because Avalon Hill also around that time gets into the game console business, releasing a bunch of games for the 2600. Oh, oh my God. You did... want to hear the crazy story about that? Okay, please, yes. Okay, so I have a game right now called Anagram Quest. It's on the iPhone App Store. 
and the Android App Store. It is a word game based on other things I've seen in the past. It's a mis- it's a mashup between anagram games with the circle of letters that you swipe to get the word and trivia. It's a it's a very bold thing. Well, when I was pitching it to publishers to get funding, I pitched it to a company called Old School Entertainment. And the CEO of that company is someone I knew of called Rebecca Heineman. She is known for uh, being the first esports winner. She won the national tournament for uh, Space Invaders on the Atari 2600. She reminded me that she was at Avalon Hill programming 2600 games. Yeah. As a young girl, as a young person, she basically built her own cartridges because she couldn't afford to buy them. So she was writing 2600 stuff for Avalon Hill. And I forgot I had met her at the, the the dots ran the company, Jack Dot, Eric Dot. They, they, I met them at the Dot house, one of their houses. We stayed there for some reason working on some stuff. And I met her uh, back then doing 2600 cartridges. Have you ever known the 2600, being able to program the 2600 is is ninja level <laughs> programming. I mean, you're, you're writing 6502 code. Well, I'll, yeah, 6502 code to basically put pixels out on that, on that uh, horizontal sweep line. There is no graphics chip. There's basically a 6502 basically putting out the, the stuff to the to the uh, video hardware every freaking scan line. So all your code has to run in horizontal blank and vertical blank. It is an art. And when you look at a game like Pitfall that Activision put out, wow, that is just a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. So yeah, Rebecca was programming 2600 games. Old School is a game company she founded. They they basically take it on the republishing of Interplay titles and so on because she was a big person at Interplay. And uh, and she's my publisher on uh, Anagram Quest. Talk about the circle is now complete, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's like a totally fun coincidence and all that. So, yeah, I, I like her a lot. I like the company. They've been very fair to me. It is an incredible struggle to launch a mobile game. Remember this. When Nintendo did the NES... In North America, they had about 768 SKUs, 768 different cartridges. On the iPhone, in days, you get that many games released. So you're competing against everything. And when people do anything on the iPhone or, or, the, or Android, and they say, what's my competition? I go, every single app out there of any kind. Because people don't want to keep installing apps. In order to get them to install your game, you have to be magnificent. And, you, and the hard lesson for a lot of people who are old school is that – your game is never done. You release a game and you metric, you measure it, you, you look at it, you see what people are doing, you see what people are doing in the game, and you modify, modify, modify. We started off with a different title. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. We constantly iterating the game. Right now, the uh, programmer on that game, because I designed and directed it, but I'm not programming it, is uh, working on a new scoring system so that people not only get the message that they completed a puzzle, but they get a score and some other information that's useful to them. You know, it's like, it never ends. So anyway, Avalon Hill. Um, yeah, but but I, they I, didn't I, pull you in. They never tried to get you to do any 2600 no, no, no. development. I wasn't that, okay. honestly, I was like a sort of high level, basic, I'll write basic and then I'll put some whatever assembly language I, I need, you know. I, I should, I was just think. I was thinking about using the um, the P system Pascal in, on the Apple II. I was just getting the fourth. In fact, my plan was, to write games in fourth, which was which which had a built-in assembler, which was much 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 faster and basic. And in some cases, if you do fourth right, it's smaller than assembly language because each instruction on a uh, machine like this 6502 is two bytes. So uh, you know you can basic and you know you can basically have a call to a subroutine, and the call itself is like two bytes. I mean it's extremely compressed. It plays a role later on in the Macintosh. I'll uh, explain that later when we get to the um, Macintosh, my intro games on the Macintosh, but. I used Forf at Rising Star. I worked on the word processor. I did the, uh, you know, some things, but I wrote an incredible 2D drafting program where you'd put a dimension down, it would calculate the distance. You know, remember everything was running in integer math. It calculated distance and display a fraction. So it displayed five and three quarter inch. It would actually display that. Um, that font was, uh, the whole font was vector font, i.e. line drawing. And the whole font was 700 and something bytes and the way it worked was each stroke was a byte. Um, I think it was three bits for X, four bits for Y, and one bit for pen up and pen down. And that's how the entire font was done, the whole ASCII font. And that game would do associative dimensioning. And if you change the size of something, the dimensions would recalculate. 
I believe when Autodesk was out of at the same time, they didn't have associated dimension. So we had to do this in integer math. The NEC 98, the, um, the Epson QX10 had an NEC 9801, which was a hardware vector drawing chip, it was unique in that regards. I used to do really cool demos that never saw the light of day, but it was very fast at drawing lines. So Galdraw, as it called, was a great product. Now, here's a little computer history. I became the West Coast manager because they let go of the West Coast manager and they needed someone to go to the West Coast and run all the application programmers. The operating system programmers were back east. They did the operating system, which was a version of CPM called TPM. Roger Amadon running that effort. Roger, by the way, later on, who was the master of the Z80 chip, ended up doing a lot of port work for Nintendo to the Game Boy, which was a Z80-based system. So anyway, I become the West Coast manager, and I have to hire people. So I hired these two people to do user interface design and also to do a, 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 a paint program, George and Rick Sanger. So I hired George Sanger in 1983. George Sanger is the fat man, the famous computer musician. So I actually got George hired. He had done some stuff, I think, at Intellivision. Rick wrote the paint program, and he wrote it in Antarctica. He was stationed in Antarctica, so he bought a small computer called a Jupiter Ace, which was a sort of Timex Sinclair-like thing that ran forth. And he wrote ValPaint. I wrote ValDraw, and I also wrote a lot of stuff in the word processor. But I was in charge of the West Coast thing. Only because of my degree, they figured he should be a good manager. I learned so many ways of screwing up. I learned how to be a manager by being forced to be a manager, and it was very hard, and mistakes were made. But we did get stuff done. It was kind of uh, interesting. And, um, yeah, so that was – Rising Star uh, was there from 82 to the very beginning of 84. Um, that's where I got my team management chops. I learned, I used to, I used to have a saying at, at Rising Star that became very important. I'd say less keyboarding, more whiteboarding, because people were just plowing ahead and writing code and it would break and be like, the, the story that someone tells people about me is I, someone was working on their computer and, and they said, Hey, I got stuff working. And I go to, it and I go, poof, and it crashes. And from that on, like, like. Everyone like I get that story gets quoted too often, you know. Uh, that I basically did that in the thing, and also I would do jokes like when we had a final product on the five and a half inch disc, I would take I write on a post it, this version is final, and I would staple it through the disc. I would take a stapler and staple it right through the disc and hand it to the to the to the CEO just to, as a joke, you know, just crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> it was so bad. Uh, the QX10 was a nice computer. I even had a color one, which was rare, that was, um, you know, 640 by 400 pixels, you know, uh, 8 bit color, but more of the aliasing. So the paint program did color. And this paint program came out in 83 before, uh, you know, Mac Paint really showed up and it was color and everything. And, you know, it was pretty nice. The, the Valdraw program I wrote would support any plotter. Uh, it, you know, I had giant plotters in my house drawing pictures of blueprints and stuff all the time it was fun you know um yeah it was a lot of fun but rising star was it was a a lesson in how not and how to manage uh product so it was useful then i now, fell in love it, with the macintosh and we'll talk about that yeah now uh, before we leave rising star <laughs> uh, <laughs> i no 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 this is uh, trust me the people who've listened to my interviews before are very used to this format uh so you're now managing the product. Now, at this point in no, time... No, at, at Rising Star, Rising Star, yes. Yeah, at Rising Star. Um, now, you're... Managing the team, the programming team in the West Coast, yes. Okay, so what exactly... Uh, I'm trying to imagine what that meant at that time. Are you coming up with the, with the general idea? Are you coordinating, telling people what to do? Or is it more an issue of somebody proposes the idea and you're just the one making sure that... Okay. It, Stuff gets done on time. Rising Star CEO is a guy named uh, uh, um, Chris Rukowski, and he is a genius. He was the guy who ran Epson's marketing for the MX80 printer. You know, Epson owned the printer market in the early 80s. Um, he came up with this whole thing called Haskey. He came up with a whole UI and a whole idea of having um, multiple computer programs. So the QX10 was an 8-bit machine based on the Z80 that had four 64K banks. So it could switch programs with just keys on the keyboard. It had a special keyboard. So Chris came with the whole idea. Chris, you know, I, 
I started working in the East. I was living in the East Coast in Pennsylvania. I started working as a programmer on the word processing team uh, in, in, with a guy in New Jersey. But here's the thing. If you look up Rising Star telecommuting, Rising Star was the first telecommuting programming outfit I can think of. Everyone sort of worked out of their houses. We had 1,200 board modems, the, the speed, the incredible speed. Uh, and we would basically work on our stuff and we would use the mail program that had been built for the QX10 by the team to transfer files and stuff. So, um, yeah, teams would be working on various pieces. There'd be a word processor team, there'd be the business graphics team, and so on. Um, the word processor was interesting because I did things like I had rules and I had a ruler on top. It was a very interesting word processor. It had... Uh, you could do bold and italics and stuff. And this is an era when the big word processor was uh, WordStar. So it was an advanced word processor. The, the thing about Rising Star is they pushed the limits of this machine so hard that people criticized it. Like Jerry Pornell, the science fiction writer who had um, his, his column on Byte Magazine was called Chaos Manor, where he talked about computers, bitched about the, the Epson QX10 Validoc system being too slow, but it was very interesting it had we had undo in the word processor which i did we had um the multiple font system you could even uh build a stack of numbers and have it do math in the word processor and then there was a business graphics wow. program that was really nice doing pie charts there was the drawing program the paint program there was the mail program and the mail program uh was really good but the one of the big innovations that chris came up with in, in valdox was the index file system which i still miss in other words, I could say, um, I could title a document, um, hey, letter to call Crass about um, the need to have really cool interviews on his podcast, right? I could write that. Later on, I could say, what documents do I have that are related to Carl? It, it had every file, even though CPM was limited to the eight characters, free letter extension, it stored, those, those were generated by the um, operating system to be some sort of time-coded thing. So they were all unique. But the actual file names were stored in a database called the Index File System, and Chris Rakowski invented that. He he's alive. He's a brilliant guy, and um, you know he came up with some really good theories. One of which was architectural stabilization, which means, for example, if you could drive a, a shift transmission car, you can drive pretty much any car made from 1925 on. You could the, the interface is the steering wheel, the brake, the clutch, the shift lever. You know, and then when cars went automatic in the 50s. Anyone could drive one of those cars. Anyone today who's driving a car could get into a 55 Chevy and drive it. The architecture has stabilized. And he believed in architectural stabilization. I think the thing that maybe we all miss, well, I, I, I started doing, I started using mouse. My program, the drawing program used a mouse, so did the paint program. It was clear to me that the mouse UI was going to be the winner. I've been exposed to it already in grad school with uh, visits to uh, Brown University the Andreas Van Dam guy who ran the graphics stuff there, um, and also lots of visits to the MIT Media Lab. Um, I taught Marvin Minsky how to play Star Raiders on the Atari 100. So there's my really? favorite favorite Marvin. And I've been to his house. I was into his house once. Yeah. So I was uh, at University of New, uh, New Hampshire. I was sort of the graphics game guy, and and I would I would do turtle graphics stuff. You know, I would you know I did projects. Um, I took a course in digital audio. Digital signal processing that I thought was useless. I liked the course. It was fun to do stuff with digital audio. I did a 3D solid maze program as one of my projects on mini computers where it was all shaded 3D. Um, played a role there. Um, but I, that digital signal processing class turned out to be extraordinarily valuable at Activision. We'll get to that eventually. So, um, yeah, that's what Rising Star was like. Valdox eventually sort of, I guess, failed in a way. Uh, you know, the uh, the IBM PC was more powerful. The Apple Macintosh was way more powerful. And uh, the company had a Mac, uh, 128K Mac, and I fell in love with the Mac. I thought the Mac was brilliant. The, the, you, you know, just the, the original Mac was like, this is a brilliant machine. Yes, it's not color. Yes, it's a small machine screen. But my God, the 68,000 is a wonderful CPU. Uh, the operating system with quick draw is a magnificent operating system. I, I see where this is going. This is the future. So uh, when you're ready, I'll lead into what happened next. Uh, okay. Uh, now, I have one more question about Rising Star because the it seems from what you're telling me, they specialize in a system that had a relatively small market share. 
Um, yeah, yeah. This, what yeah, was Epson thought this was going to be a big success, but it really wasn't because hardware-wise, it was sort of outclassed, except for the graphics chip, which was magnificent. And software-wise, even though we had this integrated operating system application system called Valdox, it wasn't extremely well received um, by the by the people in the press because it ran sluggishly because we were just pushing that poor C P CPUs as fast as we could, you know? Yeah. yeah. Was there any push or thought inside the company to just say, screw this, let's move over to the, the IBM PC or any other more popular platform at the time? There, there are people who talk about the IBM PC and, and there was a real pushback against that because they didn't want to piss off Epson. Um, uh, there was an attempt to build a better QX10 using... Um, a 68,000, there was a, some attempt to maybe go to the 68,000. We had machines like that. We had, I had, I had a 68,000 based box computer that had, I had a computer that had four CPUs in it that you could use. It had the, the Z80, the 6502, the, the uh, 8086 and the 68,000. It was a weird computer system that let you run all that stuff under various CPMs. Um, because it was a CPM 68K for the 68,000. There was, but I, I think it was just sort of like they ran out of steam, you know. I mean, I think, you know, it was like a, eventually Epson just got tired, just probably backed out of it and all that. I, I know Chris was really, you know, upset by it. Um, I was convinced that Macintosh was going to win by the end of 84. I, I could see the writing on the wall. Um, uh, interesting tale, uh, I, I started writing a Macintosh game at the end of 84, uh, and I went to uh, the Mac users group meeting in um, Santa Monica, and uh, a guy named uh, Mark, this is Macromedia, uh, can't believe it, anyway, the guy who founded Macromedia was there, mm -hmm. and he was showing an animation program called Video Works, Mark Cantor. Mark Kander founded Macromedia. He did video works and, and uh, music works. He's showing off music works. He's showing off a new animation program on the Mac called Video Works. I'm there of a guy who would, we would form a company together in the very beginning of 85, and we're like blown away. So I go to Mark and I say, Mark, this is incredible. This animation program is incredible. And he goes, oh, this is nothing. Wait till you see this Commodore Amiga that's coming out. Mark never did anything on the Amiga, but that set the stage for later on. So yeah, so okay, so I'm at Rising Star. I'm pretty convinced that we're. I'm kind of sad that we're not getting very far away. I should have done games for the uh, for the uh, QX10. I regret not doing that. But I get a Mac, uh, borrow a Mac, and I decide I'm going to redo Voyager, but in a different context. I'll make it solid 3D, and instead of just jerking one room at a time, it sort of smoothly moves forward. You can go northeast, southwest, and I build the game in 30 days called the Pyramid of Peril which was a randomly generated game that takes place in a pyramid where you're hunting, inspired by uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're inside of a pyramid. You start at the very top of the pyramid, working your way down all these rooms, and you're fighting off demons. There's health potions. There's weapons. It is a, basically a first-person shooter game. Monsters pop up. One of the writers on Bioshock told me that she was inspired um, in what, to create one of the things in Bioshock by this game when she played it as a little girl because it's you would be in the room, you turn around, and suddenly there'd be a monster there attacking you. So anyway, you're trying to find a prize, you get to the bottom, the entire game was algorithmically generated and it ran in 120K Mac, very, pretty large amount of locations. Everything was randomly generated. We used a really strange version of the fourth language which broke the machine into two 64K areas. 64K for code, 64K data. So all the addressing was still 16-bit but on a 32-bit machine, which meant it was super compressed. That, so that thing ran perfectly on a 120K Mac. Um, and that's how we launched um, AGIS development, A-E-G-I-S, which since you're in Germany, you, if you were involved in the Amiga, you know AGIS became a major Amiga publisher. So I left Rising Star, and within a month we had that game out, and we were at Macworld, the first Macworld show in San Francisco. The Pyramid of Peril is a beautiful game. You can play it on the Internet Archive. Mm -hmm. It is a tough, tough game. And it was one month from I've got an idea to boxes at this show. It was amazing. Um, and so I joined uh, um, Aegis Development as the VP of technology. Uh, Aegis would play a role later on when I got to Activision. Um, so 
we started out as a game company and we started doing some fun utilities for the Mac and then the Amiga. Uh, yeah. Why did we pick the Amiga? Well, probably because Atari wanted $5,000 for a prototype ST. Commodore gave us the Amiga 1000. They gave us a bunch of them. So I took the draw program that I had done for Rising Star and I revised it to be a floating point program with more features called Aegis Draw and eventually Aegis Draw Pro. Uh, and we started basically building stuff for the Amiga. Surprisingly, we never built a game, but we published a game called Ports of Call, done by two German programs, Rolf Dieter Klein and Martin Urig. Ports of Call was a very interesting game. It was a precursor to things like Farmville. Where in the, it was an economics game where you are running a shipping company and you start out with crappy ships and very little money. And you build a shipping empire by choosing where to run cargoes to and from based on prices and stuff. And occasionally you have to actually arcade navigate the ships into port or avoid storms. The game actually allowed you to have multiple players taking turns. It was an uh, Amiga game. And it was very well received. And it's still out there today in new versions. They have never stopped working on it. Those guys... Uh yeah, as a yeah, long-time cool. Amiga owner, I've played my share of Ports of Call. Yeah, Ports of Call is a great game. Yeah, And it saved my ass at Activision. We'll get into that later on. Ports of Call played a role in saving my career at Activision. We'll, we'll talk about how that happened. Okay. So I'm at, now, yeah. Yeah, so I'm at ages from the very beginning of 85 to the summer of 88. And um, we one of the things that goes wrong in startups is founder fights. And we got into a founder fight. As another big mistake, we should never have done that. We we had built this company up from next to nothing. I think we had fifty thousand dollars investment, and we were doing over a million dollars in business. And we were in our twenties, and you know, young and dumb basically. And we got into a fight because the CEO would like to be was extravagant. Uh, we thought was extravagant. He was mad at us. We were mad at him. It was like a sort of um, what do you call it? Palace coup that went on, and when the investors got involved, it was just a kind of a mess um the one thing i did at ages that was kind of funny well not funny but funny in a bad way is after pyramid of peril i did one more game for the macintosh i decided i would write a flight simulator for the macintosh and so i picked i had been at the shuttle launch that the first shuttle launch but it didn't happen it happened a week later because the computers went bad but i was i knew about the space shuttle i had a book about the space shuttle from when i was at the university of New hampshire so I wrote something called, uh, I wrote a space shuttle landing game, wireframe graphics on the Macintosh called Mac Challenger, the, sp the space shuttle simulator. Now, I wish I had shown this different name, but that's the way it is. But that game was yeah. innovative as hell. Uh, Mac Challenger was the first flight simulator that after you landed the shuttle or crashed it, you could look at after action video. It had simulated cameras, some of which were on the ground and some of which were in chase planes. So you, after the um, your flight, you could actually go to the VCR and review a, a fake VCR. You could review the flight, go forward, backwards, you know, pause, and you could see what you did. The other thing it had was it had cloud conditions. So when you were trying to land it in cloud conditions, you couldn't see anything out the window. It was all bogged up. But you had your instruments, and you could do instrument landing. Woo. So um, that was really cool. And uh, it had an autopilot that was a real autopilot. You could actually turn on the autopilot and you'd see the little stick on the screen because the game worked by controlling the stick that was on the screen. You could see the autopilot moving the stick and it would almost always land successfully. It was actually a really cool two separate programs, one to get you lined up the runway, one once you were lined up to do the descent and drop the landing gear and stuff. So Mac Challenger was a great product and I was really, I mean, it was a tragedy when Challenger blew up it killed, well, obviously we couldn't sell the game anymore, but Mac Challenger was the first flight simulator for the Macintosh. And yes, and yet again, it ran on a 120K Mac. It was a piece of engineering, you know? And it used a hardware tricks, like it was actually using two display buffers that was completely not something that really was supposed to happen on the Mac, but we figured it out, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, uh, I do have to ask, because we're dealing here with the Amiga and with the Macintosh. Uh, and we're in 1984. So if you're looking at the games market, 
the juggernaut machine in North America is the Commodore 64 at this point, yes, as far as yes. install base is concerned. Uh, the IBM PC is, is still chugging along with CG. I don't even think EGA has been introduced yet, or may, no, it may have CGI, 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 CG, uh, yeah. And then you also and, have the uh, Tandy stuff, TGA, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now from a business standpoint, from a business decision standpoint, I can understand from a technological standpoint, you're thinking these are the cutting edge uh, machines. Uh, the mouse interface is the UI of the future. Uh, but from a business standpoint, is there anybody inside the company going, why would, no, 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 release. We should have done, C C done C64. We mm -hmm. should have done C64, but more importantly, we knew about the NES. By by 85, we knew about the NES and we talked about it, but we didn't do anything about it. That was the machine to jump on. Oh my God. Yeah. When you were early on the NES, you were basically because it was a curated environment, that by that I mean Nintendo controlled how many titles and what titles came out. It was a wonderful market. At Activision, you could put out almost anything that was half decent on the NES and make money. Uh, but we had the video game crash, and that actually is a big deal because what happened was we did the first two Mac games, and by then the video game industry was collapsing. All the video game industry, not just consoles, but everything was collapsing in the great video game collapse, spurred on by the Atari collapse. So we didn't, I guess the management at, at, at Aegis basically felt games were not it. And what the idea was, desktop publishing really made the Macintosh what it is. People were buying Macs because they got the laser printer so they could do newspaper letters and stuff. Like, this is, um, I happen to have this here. This is a... Uh, a party my wife did well before I met her, and this is in 1992, but people were laying out stuff like this on laser printers in the uh, starting in the 80s, um, and uh, that played a real role in the Macintosh success. So he, what, what the theory was, Commodore Amiga, desktop video, people are going to use the Amiga for video production, and that was correct. That did happen. Um, mm. So it just shifted to become much more involved with video, we, we, we did it. So there was a company called Island Graphics that did a lot of Sun Microsystems stuff. And they were actually originally contracted with uh, Commodore to build a paint program, a business graphics program, and an animation program for the Commodore Amiga. Uh, and one of the best things that ever happened to Aegis, they got into a dispute with Commodore. They were furious at Commodore because Commodore kept revising the operating system. They, had, they basically felt they had put too much effort into this. It was going nowhere. Commodore was furious at Island Graphics. Dan Reamer, the president of uh, the CEO of Island Graphics, which is in Sausalito, California, had written a book called Legal Care for Your Software. So he knew the legal environment. He was a lawyer. We came in and we were like, we're going to solve this. So we basically negotiated a deal with both Commodore and Island Graphics. We took over the products. We published them as Aegis products, Aegis Images, Aegis uh, Graph, uh, Sonics, the music program, I think that came somewhat related. And... Uh, and uh, Aegis Animator. Aegis Animator was a brilliant program written by Jim Kent that was a 2D animation program, but it used polygonal filled shapes and it did morphing. You could set two different uh, frames with the uh, polygons modified and it would morph between those smoothly. It was a very powerful animation program. It was used in music videos like The Future So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shades. A lot of music videos were done. So Aegis became very much involved in video production stuff. We had a guy named Jeff Bruett who had been at Commodore, and he came into Aegis, and he was sort of a liaison to the industry. So he'd be on set with amazing stories and other, and also Max Headroom, and we'd be basically building all sorts of things. Then John Skeel, who was the head of marketing, one of the guys of marketing at Aegis, and I were at a conference, and we ran into Alan Hastings, and he had a, a 3D program called Videoscape 3D that Electronic Arts had turned down. For the Amiga, and we picked it up. It was a 3D program, and the way it worked was you had scripts, and you could write 3D sequences, and they would render them on the Amiga one frame at a time slowly. But um, I can remember, uh, I guess it was winter of 84 before CES, using a, um, a Mumatic deck, a 5840 from Sony with a, something called Lion Labs controller, and doing insert edits of every frame to do an animation called Infinite Loop. So you look up Videoscape Infinite Loop on YouTube, you'll find the video that I insert edited every frame on. I had better oh, wow. music than the one that he liked. Alan didn't like my choice of, um, of um, 
fanfare for the common man. Uh, I had seen um, Aaron Copeland perform that live in Washington, D.C. at the, uh, one of the, I think the Washington Memorial or the, no, the Lincoln Memorial or something like that. And it was just a beautiful, da, 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 da. and uh, anyway, he didn't like that. So he switched the music. So when you, when you see Infinite Loop on uh, YouTube, it's a different piece of music. But we went to CES with that. And Videoscape 3D became Lightwave and Alan Hastings, and all that, and it, it became like, he's a major guy. Lightwave was used on um, the TV show, science fiction show, I don't remember Sequest. the name. Sequest, Sequest. No, but no, no, no. Oh, Babylon 5. Fiction. Babylon 5, Babylon 5. That's... And so we published that. Then we published a program called, uh, uh, what was it called, Video Tyler. Now, Video Tyler was interesting because it had to do fonts and lots of you know beautiful stroke fonts, you know, beautiful vec polygonal fonts, not just character fonts. And it had to make the fonts look really good. So it did anti-alias letters. This also plays a role later in my career at a company called Lightspan. We'll get to that way down the road. So yeah, so Aegis was really great, um, but we got into Founder Wars and I regret it every day. Uh, John Skeel, who was at uh, uh, Aegis and also became the producer of Bub Z and also worked at, uh, you know, the Sp Steven Spielberg Game Company, DreamWorks Interactive, and he did, um, the uh the the claymation game the neverhood uh, i think it's called oh yeah neverhood yeah he was producing that so he, he had a great career uh he was at aegis and he also went to activision with me and produced the first mech warrior he was a producer on the mech warrior one he said to me once we were young we assumed this opportunity would come again to have a startup that we owned and was successful and we were foolish that we didn't get it we should have figured out how to get along with each other and we didn't do that so uh, my and also um, Dave Barrett and, Com and a company called Phillips pretty much saved my life. I'm at Aegis, and we're starting to get into compact disc. We're, we're looking into compact disc. We care about it. We think the CDI platform is going to be a big deal, compact disc interactive. So we come up with this design for a game that uh, takes place in South America, sort of like the taking the Pyramid of Peril thing, but in a South American game with an adventure with real actors and stuff, you know, um, in like 80... 586. And I guess Phillips put out, puts a huge uh, insurance policy on me because I'm like the key guy doing stuff. I'm starting to work in digital video. I started working to make digital video work. Um, anyway, they give a big policy. They give me a medical exam and they found that I have really high cholesterol and other problems. So they send me to um, uh, David Barrett, the CEO of, Active, of Aegis, sends me to Pritikin for two weeks scares the crap out of me and I, I that's the last time 1986 was the last time i had a hamburger the last <laughs> time i had a steak no i i had a serious problem i had to get it fixed and i did fix it uh, there was no statins i got my cholesterol from high 200s down to like 140 everything was great it took me a long time to lose the weight i had gained in grad school i got very fat in grad school and it took me another 10 years to lose that weight but that set me off and so yes compact business interactive saved my life do we ever do a compact business interactive product? No. CDI was plagued with problems, uh, management problems, and technical problems. Um, also, uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft pulled a really good stunt on them. Uh, I will tell the story really fast. So S Compact Disk Interactive, I believe, was launched at 85 CD-ROM conference that Microsoft put on. And it sort of took the wind out of Bill's sales because Bill was already selling things like the Compton Encyclopedia for the PC on CD-ROM and all that. He was already starting to do that. So what Bill did uh, is he went to RCA who had some sort of weird capacitive discharge laser disc thing, da 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 And he got them to announce something called Digital Video Interactive. And they showed a product on a PC with DVI cards doing full motion video, something called Palenque. And maybe you can find it. Planke was a, a, a thing about the Lion Pyramids, ha, pyramids again, right? And what that did, this is when I realized the tactical genius of Bill Gates, because what Gates did by doing that, showing up at the CD-ROM conference, his conference, I think it was 86 when he showed this, by showing full motion video on a CD, he forced Phillips to address that issue. So Phillips had to basically scramble, and they invented an MPEG. MPEG-1 was a Phillips thing for the CDI. But that delayed CDI by years. Now, at the same time, this is before I left Aegis, Activision and Electronic Arts are pouring money into CDI development. EA had a guy called Luke Bartolet, who, by the way, is currently the CTO of Unity and 
a very nice fellow. And in fact, he called me, he contacted me when this Unity mess happened a couple of weeks ago. And we had a nice Zoom call about Unity. And um, I made some suggestions that other people made and they actually followed them. So I feel really gratified. But Luke Barlet had built this incredible development system at EA. Activision had spent money with a company um, run by a woman named Laura Bedeen, who was a pioneer in, in optical disc gaming. And uh, everyone was disenchanted with CDI because it kept getting delayed and delayed. Plays a big role in my career, though. And as I said, CDI saved my life. So I'm at Aegis. I did the draw programs. We published Ports of Call from Martin Urich and your Rote to Klein. Great game. Uh, but Aegis sort of, I left Aegis uh, and I went to Activision. Um, as it turns out, I got hired by a guy at Activision called Dick Lehrberg, who was the vice president at the time. He had come from Sears, I believe. And um, they brought me in because they wanted, they had, their stock had been depressed since the video game crash. They, they wanted, it was called Mediagenic by then, which I, we all hated, but the name, um, I don't need to tell you the nickname, you can look it up. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, um, and they had a couple things going on. They had a vision called 10.0 that was doing hyper card stuff. They did a beautiful product called Focal Point. And they were also looking at doing some paint programs. Um, and the, the game division, the, the engineering division, the game division had come up with some, they did some really good games. I mean, the fall of 80, I came there in the summer of 88 and the fall of 89, they, in, they, they, they launched some really good games. They launched Ghostbusters 2. They launched um, Death Track, which was a driving fighting game. They launched MechWarrior 1, which was amazing. They did a lot of stuff with Dynamics and Interplay before Dynamics and Interplay were independent publishers. Uh, and I came in, and this is the whole, this is the story of my uh, CD-ROM career, really. I got there, and the first week I'm there, on Dick Lerberg's house, there's a box of, of the three-and-a-half-inch Mac floppies, five floppies, in a blue box. And I go, what's that? And he goes, well. I ran into these two guys in Texas. I think they work at a bank or something. And they have this uh, sort of children's thing called the manhole. It's a hypercard thing. Take a look at it. And manhole, you can look at this in the digital aquarium, that, that, that blog that someone has um, interviewed about this. Manhole blew me away. Why? Well, it was a graphical world of mystery and magic. You know, you just sort of like click on things and things would happen. When I did port, when I did Pyramid of Peril on the Mac, I had arrow buttons for going north, going forward, going backwards, turning right, turning left, going up and going down, buttons for in inventories, buttons for this, buttons for that. The guys at Cyan had figured out something called a, what I called a visual interface. There was no commands on the screen. The scene was the interface. There's a manhole cover. You click on it. Manhole cover slides with video sound. The vine grows out of it. You can go down the bottom by clicking in the hole. You can go up the vine. You go down the vine and you go to a little house. You click on the door. You're at the door. You click on the door. It opens. There's a character there. You click on the character. They start speaking to you with text and audio, blah, blah, blah. Everything is visual. I said, oh, we've got to publish this. So we published it. We published the, the five floppy hypercard product, the manhole. That was science. First game published. Uh, I take credit for recognizing their brilliance. Uh, and then a guy named Stuart Alsop, who is a pundit, and st I, he's still around. He says, Manhole is the first title, to me, that makes sense as a CD-ROM title. So we had a musician called Russell Lieblick, who had done Task Times in Tone Town, brilliant jazz musician, brilliant composer. And what we did is we took Manhole, and we added maybe a couple more sequences to it. But what we really did is we hired a live string orchestra from the San Francisco Orchestra, San Francisco Opera, their string section, and we did live performance music recorded. And I figured out a way of streaming that music in a uh, block at a time. You know, the best sampling would get at 8 bit 22 kilohertz, and it sounded beautiful. And so we released Manhole CD ROM at the very beginning of 85, and it's considered to be the first CD ROM product. Where is my box? I have a something. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. I don't know where it is now, but I have a plaque somewhere here. Well, I don't know where it is, but I have a big silver plaque that says Manhole first first CD-ROM uh, entertainment product, first CD-ROM game. It, it considered to be the first made for CD-ROM CD-ROM game. And uh, it was interesting because um, we sold more of those uh, than there were Macintosh CD-ROM drives. But then what happened is the brilliance. Uh, we had to build a version for the PC 
floppy as well as CD-ROM. So for the floppy version, we had to build a game offering tool. So if you go back to Aegis, we were doing that CDI project. I worked with a guy named David Betts who had done something called ADSYS, A-D-V-S-Y-S, which was sort of an Infocom-like adventure language, but um, a compiler that was really very fast and you could morph it to do graphics things. It, it allowed you to add external commands very easily. It was a Lisp-like language. It was Scheme, tiny Scheme, very small. I think the language itself, the runtime was like 22 kilobytes. So we took, I took what I'd done at uh, Aegis with, uh, with the, this, this Advis, this uh, Lisp language thing. And I knew Lisp from grad school because uh, I'd taken AI courses. So um, we turned it into something called MADE, the Multimedia Applications Development Environment. And we built, uh, we, of course, we had this hypercard title. What are we going to do with it? So we built a system that had object orientation, total object orientation. And we built the manhole in color for the PC. And I think the first version was um, 16 color uh, EGA or MCGA. Uh, but it also could differ to CGI and EGA. You know, it was, uh, and this is interesting because the manhole has audio all over the place. Every character it speaks to, and they're all beautifully acted characters. You know, like, hey man, cool as can. The dragon's like a jazz musician. The elephant speaks like an Indian American, you know, or India, someone from India, blah, 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 right? Mm. Well, here comes magic. When I was at Penn, there was a guy named, uh, Steinberg, who invented a graphics differing algorithm, which David Betts told me about, called um, Floyd Steinberg error diffusion algorithm. But what you do is you take a, a grayscale value, let's say 0 to 256, and you convert it to black and white, and you take the error from that conversion and propagate it forward so that it self corrects itself. And you end up with beautiful black and white images that were different from grayscale or color because you kill the color. I said to so, so actually we had a guy named Glenn Anderson who had done a program that would take a uh, a file of ones and zeros a bits stream and it would turn the speaker on with every one and turn it off with zero. This was the same technique that they used in the original Wolfenstein on the Apple II. You end up with really horrible sounding audio, but you can understand some things. It's basically a one bit DAC, but it sounded like crap. So I said to I said, hey, what if I take this program, instead of running it at 16 or 22 kilohertz, I'll run it like a, a high frequency. I'll run it at ultrasonic, around 128 kilohertz. And I'll convert the 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 8 bit audio samples or the 16 bit audio samples to ones and zeros, but propagate the error forward in time. And I remember the first piece of audio I had was the famous um, scene from Roger Rabbit where he goes, please, you know, in the bar, he makes some sort of funny sound. And it was like, uh, Watson, come here quick, because I, I had the program to do the one bit playback at any speed I wanted. It took over the CPU. I took the audio, I converted it to bit ones and zeros using this error diffusion thing that I thought would work in audio, and it worked. You could understand audio perfectly um, on the PC. It sounded good. It sounded in many ways, depending on the, the PC clone you had, it sounded as good as an 8 bit sound card. So we were able to do the manhole with digital audio on the PC, and that was a big deal. And so the manhole came out. And then there was Japan. In Japan at the time, 1980, there was a machine called the FM Towns, which was by far the best computer of its day, um, 19, uh, 1990. Um, it had uh, a free 86. It had, it had uh, a graphics card that could do, uh, could do 32,000 colors. It had eight 8-bit eight channels of sound. It had a CD-ROM drive built in. It was a beautiful machine. So uh, I go to Japan with uh, a guy named Paul Kohler, and Paul says to me before the meeting with Fujitsu, he says, you know, they've only sold 80,000 machines. What are we going to ask for to port this? I go, let's ask for half a million dollars. He goes, what? I go, look, Fujitsu's not doing this machine to sell a lot of them. Their main thing is business computers. It's all about prestige. It's Japan. It's about being presence. It's about your, your, your status. And he's looking at me like, what? I go, yeah, I just read this book about Japan. Trust me. So we go in there. We ask for half a million dollars. And they give us $400,000 to port manhole. And what we do is we, uh, we have a guy in Japan. So we do all the fonts, all the graphics for the text. We have someone use a Mac, Mac kanji to create the uh, kanji fonts. And we hire a puppet troupe in Japan to do the Japanese versions of the uh, English voices. And we allow you to switch audio from English to Japanese and text from English to Japanese independently. So then we take that idea and we go to an uh, educational publisher in Japan called Tokyo Shojeki. 
And we convinced them that we should do a version for the NEC 9001, which is really the machine in Japan at the time. It's sort of like a PC, but different. And we use my digital audio thing that Activision eventually patents. Uh, and we get it on the Tokyo Soseki, and they built an entire package, which was a book, a picture book with the disc in it. It was just gorgeous. Um, so yeah, uh, for a couple of years, all I did was make manhole run on different machines. I think it was a version <laughs> eventually built for the PC engine, though I wasn't so much involved in that. Um, but the language, the development system made, which was this object oriented language that did graphics. So we had this whole graphics compression system that was pretty awesome. Um, you know, it compressed the heck out of, uh, of uh, 256 color graphics. It, it just four to one, five to one, and it, it was fast. It didn't take much CPU to, to decompress, which was critical at the time because the CPUs were lame. Um, yeah. And now, um, now when you found, uh, when you first encountered the manhole running on a Mac using HyperCard, uh, and just to remind the viewers, what exactly was HyperCard? HyperCard was an Apple development system that basically used a, a metaphor of cards and fields. You could program business software in it. It was a very cool system. You could you could create hotspots, and it was a, the scripting language was called HyperTalk. It was very simple, object orientated. Um, people were doing things like um, recipe books. They were doing people were doing stories. People there was a thing called Indigo Gets Out about a cat that some woman did who was um, actually the psychiatrist for uh, Bill Atkinson who wrote who wrote hybrid card. That's why she had it. Oh. And uh, called, uh, let me see, it gets out, uh, uh, good now. Amanda good now wrote that. God, my memory is good sometimes. Today is a good day. <laughs> um, so Amanda good now wrote, then go gets out. I wanted to publish it, but Activision was interested in it. And so hybrid card was an entire like programming system that was graphical. You could write, do a whole bunch of stuff before you even program, but it had this cool language. Focal point was an organizer that Activision published that was done in hybrid card. Um, it was um, really good. I mean, you basically had a calendar, you had contacts and everything. Uh, it was magnificent, a little done in HyperCard. They had a whole division called 10.0, uh, and that was a big deal. Um, there were other HyperCard products. So you, HyperCard was a platform and a development system that, that Apple did for the original black and white Mac. Um, it was cool. It was great. Um, by the way, NIST, which comes out later, was done in HyperCard with some yeah. extensions to allow for color. So HyperCard was a cool development tool. It was, um, it enabled, P you know, I miss this sort of thing. Um, I'm told that there are some things like uh, live code that's similar to it, but I miss the whole idea of being able to just think of stuff and throw together programs and games fast, really fast, without having to think about it, you know? And if you are doing a point and click type thing where you point at something and it goes to a new image. So people would do like, they would do like, Hyper card stacks on subjects, you know, and all that. And you'd click on the image and take you to another image, click on the image, take another image. You had multiple hotspots, you had text fields, you had operations on text fields. You could you could do like database like things. Uh, it was very cool. And Activision was working on a product called um, uh, Steering Wheel or something like that. Anyway, it was, it was a very advanced product that did network stuff. They were trying, starting to do network stuff, trying to do stuff like let's schedule meetings for the company and find out when, when everyone's available at HarperCard in the uh, early 90s. They were really trying to do that. Um, so Now, yes. So the HarperCard, was there some kind of licensing fee with the no, uh, no, that you no, had to pay no, for no, Apple? No, 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 no. It only ran on the Mac and you could use it all you want and you had to pay Apple damn thing. Okay. What, a, what an interesting idea. Yeah. So did that create a problem when porting it to other systems? Did you guys yeah, have I had to, to write create your own? We did. That's what we did. We created our own development system called MADE. We had to do it. It wasn't mm -hmm. like easy as HyperCard because it didn't have the graphical interface, but it had the object orientation that could do all the functionality that you needed for graphics. It did music. Gra HyperCard did audio as well. Very nice audio. Um, when I did the uh, Macintosh CD-ROM of Manhole in HyperCard, I was able to like break audio into chunks and have a background task downloading the audio so the audio would always be playing while you were still interacting with it. When we did the um, the PC CD-ROM version of Manhole in 256 color and delivered to EGA, we used Redbook audio, which was CD audio, which was the best quality you could get. But to do that, we had to make sure that once we started playing the CD audio, everything that was going to happen had to be in RAM. So we had we had object oriented calls that would preload everything, you know, like if you were, you know, before the audio would play, everything you were going to do in that scene was preloaded. So it could, the CD-ROM drive 
could be playing the audio without being touched. We had caching in that system for code, caching for graphics and all that. You know, and was it what was it called? The extra memory in the PC. Oh, there was some name for it beyond expanded memory. Yeah, 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 expanded memory, blah, 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 blah. Um, anyway, um, that system would evolve the game engine for Lever Goddess of the Phobos 2 and Return to Zork. At the same time in 89, I started working on digital video. Funny story, we had digital video working. I, I, I took the graphics compression system that was four to one, which broke up video into cells of four by four pixels and encoded them as um, one color, two colors, four colors, or the full 16 colors uh, of that in that block of pixels called a megapixel. And we used that with a lossy technique where you, you plug in how much loss you were willing to take and we convert two of these color images into that. The image behind me is from Return to Zork, and everything in that image is basically compressed with that system called Flex. Um, everything is super compressed. And uh, what I decided was I could do video by saying, okay, well, we'll throw away the 16 color block. Uh, we don't need it. Very rarely do we use a 16 color block, which is zero compression ratio. And we'll make it a, this did not change in the next frame. We'll make it a, this did not change in the next frame, and we'll do video. So we had the video demo on the Macintosh. It was a, a video shot out the back of the space shuttle. And we actually showed it to Apple's advanced technology group because it was, you know, it was, it was a reasonably sized window running a very smooth video of this, this scene from the back of the shuttle. It was very impressive. This is before people were doing, you know, QuickTime and all that. And uh, the video, the you know, the, um, the Apple video standard. And uh, Apple's advanced technology group is a funny story. They say, well, why would you do that when you could just control a laser disc? But we cared. And um, that's when Activision started getting into financial trouble. We'll talk about that. But we did use the video on a product called Joe Montana Football for the PC. So the opening scene of Joe Montana Football with Joe throwing a football was using that digital video standard. But it would not really show up in a product until the return to Zork. So what happened to Activision? Why did Activision get into financial troubles in the summer of 1990? Well, there's a thing called the bar patent, Magnavox. This is a video game patent related to balls bouncing off objects and, and screens and all that. Now, the bar patent was challenged by Activision and other companies, including Nintendo, because there was a game in 1956 at Brookhaven Labs called Tennis for Two. Uh, but Magnavox prevailed because Tennis for Two was on an analog computer. Uh, what people don't realize is that when that patent judgment came down, it was a mess. Now, Activision at the time was run by a guy called Bruce Davis, who was a nice, likable fellow. Well, not if you were at Infocom. He was not a nice guy to Infocom. He was mean to Infocom. And you can watch the Infocom documentary if you want to see that. There's a documentary about Infocom. But anyway, he was litigious in a way. And, and um, I remember at one point, he was suing the founders of Infocom that were working for us for misstating the goodwill, if you know what that is, your lawyer. Yeah. And I said to Bruce, but they're working for us and you're suing them. But they're working for us on titles. He goes, well, they shouldn't take it personally. And I thought that was crazy. But I, I did like Bruce. Bruce did give me rope. He let me do the manhole. He let me do um, Lover Goddess of Phobos 2, which was actually a very difficult title to get out and bomb spectacularly. But anyway, I digress. So Activision gets um, a judgment uh, in the summer of 1990 for like seven and a half million dollars. And back then, the, the terms we had with the cartridges, which were our main business, Nintendo cartridges, was net forever. In other words, Toys R Us was the, was the vendor. And Toys R Us would pay you when they damn well wanted to pay you. And they usually paid you when they wanted their titles. So what happened when Activision got hit with this judgment in the Magnavox case, Activ all the law products came back to us. Law products were returned really fast. And Activision was basically imploding. Um, we went, by time... Bobby Kotek moved the company to Los Angeles. We were down to like 12 people from hundreds. Um, and I was offered positions. I was offered the head of Sega CD-ROM. But Bobby convinced me to stay on at Activision. Bobby knew me. How did Bobby know me? Well, Bobby had been on the Amiga. He had done a word processor for Amiga. I think it was called WordCraft. But more importantly, his company took over Ports of Call when Aegis folded. They released Ports of Call on the PC. So Bobby knew of me. I knew Bobby. So I'm the senior guy at Activision. I was director of technology by the time Bobby came in in the late 90s, I think. So he retained me and uh, eventually made me the vice president of technology at Activision. 
But here's the thing about Bobby. I know people don't like him that much, but he did something really important. Never Goddess of Phobos was a game built when activism was in Chapter 11. It was done by drawing on paper and scanning it. It was written by Steve Moreski, who had done the original Never Goddesses, but it was designed to be a very easy game. Mistakes were made. Biggest mistake in Never Goddess of Phobos 2 is you could choose between three characters to play. You could play uh, Bart, the gas station attendant. You could play Lydia, his girlfriend. Or you could play... Um, Barf the alien, you know, you know, the alien guy, you know, the pulsating inconvenience from the planet X. Well, the problem with that is it, it just made the game not too deep and way too easy, but it had some fun things. It had the digital audio. It had the cool text, the anti-alias text. Um, it was uh, completely graphical. You know, we took the idea of, uh, of, of, uh, the, of uh, manhole and we didn't have any arrows or anything. You just clicked where you wanted to go and you went there. And the cursor would change shape to show you what it was going to do. We had an inventory button, a box on the screen for inventory. It did all those things. But because it was three characters you could choose from and because it was rushed and because the company was basically in Chapter 11, it was a low-budget affair that bombed. Bobby, to his credit, did not hold that against us. He knew what we had gone through and he let us do Return to Zork. Return to Zork was produced by Eddie Dumbrower, who had done Earl Weaver Baseball. I had digital video working, and I wanted to, we wanted to do the title and make it, like, make it the best adventure game ever. Also, we wanted to make it the hardest adventure game forever. Lever Goddess had been panned mercilessly for being way too easy. So Return to Zork is deliberately difficult with puzzles that are kind of very obscure, and you can make mistakes that you don't find out for 20 hours. It did have mm. saved game. But it was a very unfair game in many ways. That's why there's thousands and thousands of videos about Return to Zork. But Bobby, to his credit, let us do that game. Um, the other thing that happened was the reason why Activision under Bruce Davis had patented my digital audio system is the company was using pulse width modulated audio. That's where you, you create a pulse that's on and you turn off at a certain period of time and the width of the pulses determines the audio. It works. It runs in background, which mine didn't. But it has a ringing noise, which is the frequency of the actual pulse. So you get a ring behind this, you're hearing something and there's a ringing going on at the same time you're listening to digital audio. Mine was perfectly clean. So Activision published that because they were really gung shy of being sued. And they actually, uh, I mean, patented it. They actually patented it. So that's one of my patents was the digital audio patent. Uh, so Bobby comes into Activision to rescue it. Um, and uh, a couple of things he does. He, uh, they... They get all the old Infocom titles, you know, even though Infocom was on the outs. Uh, and uh, they published them as um, uh, the Lost Treasures of Infocom. They greenlight Return to Zork. Uh, and they managed, after many, many pit, pit pratfalls, to get MechWarrior 2 out. So Return to Zork was a big success. Uh, I should mention that with Manhole, we did get bundle deals with stuff like the Head Start computer, which shipped with the C-Drom drive. So... We were familiar with doing deals with hardware people. So the bundle deals with um, the manholes with a company that did an MPEG hardware card called the Real Magic card. And that version, if you look up Return to Zork Real Magic, you'll see uh, R-E-E-L Magic. You'll see beautiful versions of Return to Zork and MPEG-1 because that was an MPEG card for the PC. So Return to Zork was way out there in terms of interface. By that I mean, yes, it had the graphical interface that we had seen in manhole. Click on things and things happen. But it had an object-to-object -object interface using these diamonds that Eddie, Eddie had pointed me to an article with a circle that was divided into pie slices. But I went with diamonds because of something called taxicab geometry. It's very easy to find out if you're clicking inside of a diamond. Um, in the mathematics, it's extremely simple. So we went with these diamonds that were, and you basically had animated uh, things that told you what you could do with objects. And the text, a reverse parser would tell you the text. So like, dig up the bottom plant with the shovel, which is the correct thing to do. Because if you're the very beginning scene, if you pull the bonding plant out of your hands, it dies eventually, and you need that plant hours and hours later. So Return Zog had that cool object-to-object -object interface, but this is where it gets crazy. It had a lot of NPCs that were actors, real actors shot in video. Everything the actor said to you was recorded on a virtual tape recorder. Also, you had a camera, and you could take a picture of every scene you wanted, and you could so you could ask a character about what any other character said. You can ask a character about a picture you took, you could ask a character about any object you were carrying. You could ask a character about the map that was automatically being drawn for you. Um, Return to Zork was, uh, yes, an unfair game, and yes, a silly story, but it was so innovative in the use of digital video and the characters and the puzzles and stuff. 
I mean, there's a puzzle in there where you have to feed a cow carrots and then warm your hands on a, before milking the cow because otherwise it'll kick you on a haystack that you light with a match that you found. Then you warm your hands, you milk the cow, and you put the milk into a container called the fromage. And later on, you reach this really dark place that's got bats and stuff. And in order to see, you have to drink that cow milk that came from carrots. That's how crazy it was. That's how insane the puzzles were. Um, uh, but it had some real moments of magic. It used, it worked on floppy with, uh, the, one of the things about the, I did a digital audio compression system that was called variable ADPCM. So just like the images, I broke audio into small segments and I would compress the audio variably depending on how much information there was. And it turns out that that compression parameter also could tell you where people's lips were. So on the PC version, the floppy version, uh, all the characters that talk to you, their lips were actually being driven by the audio compression system, the flap. Then on the CD-ROM version, we had digital audio, digital video, digital video, yeah. Now, I do have to ask here because uh, Manhole is coming to you guys almost in a completed state, correct? Yes, almost pretty much yeah. done. Yeah, we, pretty the much color done. version was a lot of work, you know, because we had to do all the graphics over in full color and all that, but yes. Mm -hmm. And we had to re-script in a completely different system, but no, the Macintosh version was completely done. All we did was ask Cyan for some more images, then bring Russell Liebig in, our musician, to work with a live orchestra to compose a bunch of music that streamed as you played the game, and it, would, it, it really elevated it, and it was very well loved. Yeah. And and moving on then to Leather Goddesses, obviously a lot more artwork, more audio and so forth. And then Zork is just a whole nother level with the actors and so forth. Uh, how are you guys internally dealing with budgetary issues in this time of CD-ROM creating spiraling costs? And, and how are you calculating or guesstimating what the sales figures are because you're still hedging your bets with floppy disk versions of the games as well. Yeah, we are. So, but, so yeah. So here's an example. Um, Manhole, uh, when Manhole was being built, to go to a company and get a sample disk made was hundreds of dollars and, and a CD-ROM burner was extremely expensive. We had the bet that we could make it work. So we, we, we Manhole CD-ROM, we got it working on a hard disk and um, we got one disc made for someone because we couldn't afford to buy a burner at the time, and it worked. And they thought it wouldn't work. They had they had they had what they call emulators that would emulate the CD-ROM speed, and they thought the manhole CD-ROM wasn't going to work. That my audio paging wasn't going to work, but I believed it did because I knew how I could tell. I knew what the seek time was on CD-ROM. I knew how often we were we were fetching audio every four seconds. So I figured four seconds was enough time to fetch X kilobytes of audio forgot screwing up the CD-ROM drive, and yet the CD-ROM drive could be going and doing other things at the same time. It might delay it a little bit, but it would work. So that worked. Uh, by the way, the next title we published from Cyan was called Cosmic Osmo, and that was all them. They did the entire Cosmic Osmo CD-ROM. And in mm -hmm. one of the funny moments is, um, in 1990, I fly to Kyoto with Paul and some other people to an attempt to get a Super Nintendo license and we bring a Macintosh with a hard drive to show Cosmic Osmo to prove that we're cool. Miyamoto was in the meeting, and he said, this is really beautiful, but you got to have more game here. And he was right. And I got to see the Super Nintendo, and I got to see uh, a game called Pilot, called Dragonfly that became Pilot Wings. And I met this the Yamamushi, the head of the CEO of uh, Nintendo. And I lost my fucking camera on the air train coming back to, to Kyoto. I left my camera on the train by mistake. Oh, no. People. Oh, my God. But anyway, I got to meet all those people. Uh, and because we had Cosmic Osmo, they gave us the license to do um, Super Nintendo, Super Famicom stuff. So we got a Sony News workstation, Super Famicom development system in America before anyone else. But then Activision started imploding and nothing really came of it. We had this Sony Unix workstation, everything in Japanese. And I remember oh. playing around with Mode 7 Hex, the 3D mode on the Super Nintendo and all that. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just, you know, it was just freaking crazy. But yeah, we uh, demoed, Cosmic Osmo was a really great game. And then what happened was, activists going to Chapter 11, they don't pay Cyan. They they mess up with Cyan. They lose Cyan. And Cyan is a little title after Cosmic Osmo. What was it called? Oh, yeah, Mist. They do Mist or Broad about it. They, activists could have had it. They could, oh, all no. they, do was, they could have had it. They blew it. 
they blew it because they were in chapter 11 and instead of just taking care of Sion because Sion was special, they pooped it and they lost, they could have had Miss. That was when I called it lack of vision. They could have had Miss. <laughs> um, could have had the, could have been a contender, you know, instead I, you know, so anyway, um, uh, okay, so uh, this is where my career takes the big pivot. Maybe this was a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. Um, I had done Return to Zork, and then I did stuff like Rodney's Fun Screen, which is a story in itself. Rodney on Greenblatt had done a children's thing in Hypercard called Rodney's Fun Screen, which is a children's title. We did it in full color for the PC called Rodney's Fun Screen. We shipped it in a cereal box. We shipped in a cold cereal box with the top and everything. It was really cute. And at that time, uh, Bobby was in the company, and we wanted a really good sound system. So the guys who did Ports of Call had taken a parallel port thing and wired a bunch of resistors to create a digital audio converter. And it sounded like crap because they hadn't taken a course in digital signal processing like I had. So I knew all it needed was a low-pass filter. So we added a capacitor resistor for a low-pass filter, and it sounded like a sound blaster. And we were manufacturing them in Hong Kong for a buck a piece, and we put them in the box. So when you've got Lever Goddess of the Phobos or you got Rodney's Fun Screen, and I think the floppy version of Return of the also, you got the life-size sound enhancer, in it, which was a dongle you plugged into your printer port on your PC and ran a wire to your stereo, and you had digital audio, and we gave it away in the game. Because Rock Theater Klein and Martin Eric, who did Ports of Call, which Bobby picked up, which H is published. It, it's it's a it's a great story of serendipity because it just doesn't make sense of all that to happen, but it did. So we had this beautiful audio device, and I think Glenn Anderson, a guy who had done the on off thing, he wrote a beautiful multi uh, tasking um, four voice music synthesizer, and we built these little tiny samples that were different instruments. So Return to Zork, when you play the floppy version, is using the synthesizer. MIDI synthesizer that has digitally sampled instruments, but they're very, very small samples because it has to fit in very low memory. It, it sounds great. Return of Zork music is great. Of course, with the CD-ROM version, you get magnificent audio. You know, it's it's much better. Yeah. Now, oh, this, uh, yeah. the sound the sound dongle. Uh, obviously, I mean, yeah. it, there's a couple of different companies trying this. Disney does the same. Has yeah, their Disney's, own sound Disney's source. Was much more expensive. Much more expensive. Oh, much more expensive, and it had its own built-in speaker and everything. Uh, but they also sell that as a standalone product. Right. Now, we never, we never saw the standalone. We never did. No. And now, was there no. any conversation of trying to do that at the time? No, because by then we knew everyone was going to get sound cards. It was just inevitable. This was just a bridge to that time. Everyone oh, was okay. getting sound cards. You know, it was just obvious. You know. Um, and oh, we also did a Macintosh version of, Re of Return to Zork as well, which was higher resolution and gorgeous. But uh, but I think the the real magic version, which was MPEG, uh, was probably the best version in terms of look and feel. Yeah. So gotcha. um, so here's what happens with me. Uh, you know, in the most ironic of twist, Activision really wanted to emulate Mist. And I was in a different direction. I was like into deeper puzzles, deeper character interactions, you know, da da da. Like uh, I recently had a conversation with someone from Rockstar and asked them point blank if they're going to use LLMs, large language model AI, in their character interactions. And they are going to. That He said they're going to do that. So I think they're going to do that. So the next time there's a Red Dead Redemption, maybe not the next version, but the version afterwards or whatever, the characters will be intelligent. They'll have real conversations with them. They'll understand how you speak. They'll speak to you. It'll all be AI driven because that's where things are going to go, you know, uh, I think. Um, anyway. So I was heading in that direction. I wanted to do deeper, deeper games. There were a couple scenes in Return to Zark where I felt we came close to achieving that. The, the waif underneath the bridge, uh, to me, is like so close to what we really want, where there's this guy who's very scared. He's a waif. He's underneath the bridge, and he's very upset. He won't talk to you. But if you give him tickets to um, an amusement park, then he starts opening up and tells you a lot of useful information. I also wanted to start MacGyvering the game, making the puzzles real physics puzzles. You know, um, so that, you know, like like the stuff in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, you know, puzzles that basically require you to, you know, oh, like the, you know, the, the the example that comes to mind is Die Hard 2 with the water puzzle, the, the where there's a bomb that's going to go off unless they put the water bottle in three gallons of water and all they have is a five gallon, two gallon jug and they have to figure out how to get three gallons of exact water into a jug. I love that that scene in that movie. And, I, and that's where I wanted to go. But, you know. We were at odds. And the other thing is, I was pretty well paid by then. 
And um, Activision wasn't keen on increasing my salary. But I had gone to a free DO conference uh, that summer of 94. And by then, we moved to Los Angeles. Activision was in LA and all that. We'd, I moved my whole family down to LA. I had two children by then. And someone at the uh, free DO conference cornered me, a guy named Dr. Barry Sandrew, who was famous for doing, inventing film colorization for Turner, Turner TV. Mm. So Barry cornered me and said, look, I'm at a company which at the time was called Curriculum Television Corporation, but eventually became known as Lightspan, Lightspan Partnership. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the new set-top boxes, which can do video and interactivity, and we're going to basically build software for schools that's beautiful educational adventure games to teach math and language arts, blah, 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 and all that. And they go, we'd like you to talk to you. So I, I drove down to La Casa and had an interview with them, and they offered me a lot more money. <laughs> And they offered me the chance to build uh, all this stuff for schools. And I had young children that cared about that. So I left Activision to join this startup called Lightspan Partnership. So Lightspan was using Mark Cantor, the guy who I'd seen at the Mac user group all the way back in 1984, uh, his system called Director, to build all these beautiful multimedia titles using a box called the British Telecom, Apple British Telecom set-top box, which was basically a Macintosh LC free or whatever too with an MPEG card and, and the hooks to connect to cable television. Everyone was convinced in the early 90s, or mid-90s, 1994, 1995, that cable was going to get this interactivity on every television. You were going to basically be able to play games and stuff on the cable box. It was going to be awesome. They were going to have quality digital video. There was a thing called the Orlando Project that Time Warner did in Orlando, Florida, with a set-top box that was basically a silicon graphics box. Apple was doing the British Telecom box. Everyone was gung-ho. And this looked like a really fun opportunity, and, and they offered me equity, offered money, and I moved down to San Diego. Um, and the big difference is this company was staffed by teachers, a lot of teachers, because a lot of educators. At Activision, I was pulling in 80-hour weeks. I was a wreck. You know, I was like well over 300 pounds. I was a completely freaking wreck. Um, and Lightspan was like a normal company, normal working pace, because people were used to that. And uh, it, by 96, I had dropped, uh, in 96, I dropped 140 pounds of weight. So, wow. a, so even though I left AAA gaming and never really got back to it, um, you know, Lightspan was a very good move for me personally. Um, and it was a very cool company, very cool people. But something happened. By 95, um, it was clear things were a mess in the world of interactive set-tops. I went to a conference, and the people on stage showing what was going to happen in cable set-tops were the same people who did the compact interactive operating system. Uh, I think it was called Microware or something. Anyway, I turned this on and say, this is never going to happen. These people didn't get CDI to work. They're not going to get cable set-tops to work. These boxes are too expensive. No one's going to have a $5,000 box in their house. Blah, 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 blah. So the chairman, oh, um, the chairman of the company, and, and you know, we have a big meeting, and he goes, you've got to find a platform we can move to. Now, my last meeting in Japan at Activision was in 1990 with this group working on an accessory for the Super Famicom called the PlayStation. They were working on a CD-ROM drive for the Sony, for the place for the uh, Super Nintendo called the PlayStation. Mm -hmm. By the way, everything you've read about why Nintendo dropped Sony is possibly wrong, and I can prove it. This is please do me. because this is a fact that it's a boogie boo of mine because I have okay. great disagreements with other historians about it. Uh, I'm, Console War I'm says Console War says Nintendo thought it was too expensive and they dropped the project. Horseshit. Here's what happened. Ask yourself this question. Why in the hell did Nintendo license Link and other Nintendo properties to Philips for CDI? Why? Why? Why did Nintendo announce they were switching from Sony to CDI as their optical disc platform? Why? Why would they do that? The bar patent. Bang the box is owned by Philips. Nintendo lost the bar patent too, not just Activision. They lost that patent. Mm -hmm. So their settlement was probably included, we're going to use you for our optical discs, and we're going to have a statute of limitations on how many years we have to use you, and we're going to license these cool titles for CDI for your CDI platform. Isn't that great? 
So that's how my theory is Nintendo settled with Magnavox slash Philips because Philips is Magnavox. Um, we way, actually Magnavox, we have the documentation to prove that that is the reason why Philips gets the game licenses. Right, and that's why Nintendo yeah. dropped Sony because Nintendo actually had a conference where they talked about using CDI as their platform. That actually did happen. Yeah. Nintendo actually made that announcement. So that's yeah. why it happened, folks. It has nothing to do with the cost. So uh, Nintendo chose the CDI. Why didn't they build a CDI platform? Well, because CDI was flawed. It was expensive, and 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 by the time it came, look, when CDI was announced, everyone in the game industry, EA, Activision, we were gung ho for it. We loved the idea. Oh my God, look at this, sixty-eight thousand. Da, 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 da. This looks really good. And delay after delay. It was supposed to launch in eighty-eight. It didn't really launch till the nineties, and by then it was like it was um it was you know uh, obsolete. Mm. Story about Trip Hawkins. So Trip Hawkins, who founded Electronic Arts, founded Free Do. Creo was trying to use the VHS model. By that is, they their idea was they were going to work with uh, Matsushita, who did V who did the VA, VHS uh, cassette tapes, and they were going to build a platform that would license to other hardware people. So Free Do, which was a nice box, decent box. Yeah. Um, the idea was that a mobile company would make it, but the problem was. The price was eight hundred dollars in nineteen ninety uh, five dollars ninety three ninety four dollars. Yeah. Too much money. So Trip used to say when the PlayStation came out that there's no way Sony can sell this at this price. There's no way. And and I, I said to someone, Sony doesn't care. Sony will lose money on every single one. They'll gain the market. They'll make it up in volume. They'll make money on titles. Blah 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 blah. So. I'm tasked at the end of 95 to figure out what are we going to do? And I know about PlayStation. I know about Saturn. I know about CDI and FreeDO and CDTV and CD32 and all that. Commodore, by the way, um, one of the reasons I got into marketing, because I've had multiple careers, uh, game QA tester, game programmer, game designer, manager of technology, manager of game production. And marketing. I was CMO at a, at a business software company for a while. I was I ran marketing at uh, PlayScreen. But anyway, one reason I got into marketing is because I looked at the Amiga history and said, this is the greatest machine of its time, and Commodore totally screwed it up. Story about that. I'm at Activision. I just joined Activision. And I see some Amiga people at an event or somewhere, and I go to them, you know, the Amiga 500, that's your C64. If you can get that out there and get the price down, you're going to be the next, next C64. Clearly superior game machine, decent price. You can probably push it down more. Um, oh, by the way, Bobby Kodak offered to buy this, the Amiga chips from Commodore and build a cartridge console, and they turned them down. Do you know that? No. When did that happen? Was that uh, that's before, before, Activision? Act, before, Act, before Activision? Bobby Kodak went, and you can look it up. Bobby Kodak approached Commodore about licensing the Amiga chip technology and building a console, cartridge-based console based on it, which would have been brilliant because Bobby's smart, right? Yeah, um, they, they they turn them down. So what happened to me is I meet them, talk about how the 500 could be the next 64, and they said to me, "Oh, we we're selling Amiga 3000s to the government running Unix. This is going to be really big." I go to myself, "Oh my oh, God, no. these people are smoking crack. This is going to fail." The only thing that kept Commodore Amiga alive for a while is New Tech and the digital toaster, the video toaster. The video toaster kept Commodore alive the same way the light the uh, the laser printer kept Apple alive until Jobs came back. But for Commodore, it was no Steve Jobs. There's no one who came back and said, stop doing this stupid shit. Your game company, your game console, your game PC, your creative PC, don't don't go after Unix-based machines. Are you out of your mind? Anyway, so Commodore, you know, Commodore, um, you know, couldn't market, you know, uh, heaters, electric heaters to Eskimos. They, you know, they, they, yeah, they yeah. just, oh, and of course, the worst ad in technology of any computer whatsoever is the first Amiga television ad. I call it the dead baby ad. The ad where the old guy walks up to an Amiga and suddenly there's a baby floating in space. They wanted to outdo Apple's 1984 ad. Oh, it was horrible. It was a horrible television ad. And everything like that was bad. I mean, they got a little better later on when they had the astronaut coming to the house with the kid and all that. And Aegis tried really hard. Aegis would show up with Amigas everywhere. They were on major TV shows, Max Headroom. The, uh, you know, amazing stories, you know, uh, they did music videos with people. They got people to do music videos with the Amiga. Commodore didn't get it. They just didn't get it. Anyway, so that's dead, you know. So we didn't want to do CD32. We didn't even want to do CD, uh, CDTV. Um, CDI was definitely out. FreeDO claimed they had Macromedia Director running on stun. 
Unfortunately, Bill's uh, headphones, the battery died on him, so we had to switch over, and uh, during that process, I screwed up a little bit, so there's a couple of seconds of audio missing. Uh, the summary of it is that his quest to find the right platform to move development to continued, and as one is wont to do, he decided to check in with the tech gurus over at id software and as we jump back in he couldn't remember exactly who he had talked to and i help him out there uh, but he's looking for advice on which next gen system is the one he should be betting on okay back to oh, the show the other fellow from uh carmac carmac Trust me, he says, it sounds a piece of shit. playstation's it i picked the playstation <laughs> but then we're facing a problem because we're, we were running on like Max basically, and now we're running on the um, the PlayStation, and it's an NTSC device, and we have to do text. It's an educational company. There's a lot of reading stuff and all that. Um, by the way, Lifespan was enormously funded by TCI, Comcast, and Microsoft. Two of those being cable companies. Microsoft, uh, Lifespan's funding pre-IPO was on the order of $125 billion in 1990 money. It was an enormous company with hundreds of people. So everyone's counting on me to find a platform and figure out how we're going to run on it. So I say the PlayStation's it. So let's do a Skunkworks product to see that we can do what we need to do on PlayStation. And Lightspan had invested a fortune in production. They had done a reading series called Stratus, where they actually shot actors in period costumes with film like in like post Civil War, War of 1812, San Francisco earthquake, they had used the people, the special effects teams on Slider. They went nuts with production, and they really wanted to use digital video everywhere. So whatever we chose had to have really good digital video, and had to be able to do stuff on top of the video. And the PlayStation could possibly do that. So I I found a company in San Diego at the end of uh, 1995, and we did a test where we did video with stuff happening, and for text. I went back to what I'd done at um, Aegis with Video Tyler, and we did anti-alias text. We did text that had an outline in every font that basically reduced the NTSC ringing. The thing about NTSC technically is that even though there's a resolution on the scan line going across of about 320, the color resolution is actually less um, the way NTSC is coding, never the same color twice. Uh, you know. So anyway, uh, we, we got anti-aliasing working, so the text was pretty nice and readable. And we had to find a development system. When I first got to uh, Lightspan, one of the advisors of the company was Gilman Louie of uh, Spectrum Holobyte. And he said to me, Bill, don't build another development system. But there we were in the uh, very beginning, very end of uh, 1995, having to build a development system. One of the guys who worked with me at Rising Star was a guy named David Warhol, who had a company called Real Time Associates. And he had built this really very basic development system. It looked like Fortran. But it ran on a bunch of personal uh, consoles, including the PlayStation, and it was just good enough that we could do what we wanted to do. We added support for the video and stuff, and that was called Chug. And we had to get a lot of people onto converting all these titles, a lot of people, hundreds, like 100 people on this thing, multiple companies. And we couldn't buy development systems, so Chug ran on a PC, and you could build the title, and it was, and it was going to run on the PlayStation. You never had to have the PlayStation development system. It would just work. Um, and so... By the summer of 1995, Play, uh, Lightspan had its first um, PlayStation titles, and Le Lightspan had negotiated a deal with Sony to allow it to um, use the PlayStation as its platform and sell PlayStations directly to schools. It's a big deal. So uh, that's what happened there, and we built all these titles for the PlayStation, over 100 titles. Lightspan had more SKUs for the PlayStation 1 than any other company. And Sony was all good with it because we sold directly to schools and that to the public. Now, there's a lot of videos about lifespan titles talking about how lame they are, but really what it was was curriculum. It was basically teachers basically meeting state standards and coming up with um, stuff for curriculum. So I came up with, for example, at one point they had to figure out how to, students to identify uh, shapes that were basically fractions. These shapes are all one thirds. These shapes are all one quarters. So I took the scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and you had to walk a character across a uh, floor in a Mayan pyramid. Um, and uh, if he stepped on the wrong tile, he fell through. And the, his clue was to look for the um, 
the, 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 the tiles that were broken into the right fractions. So I was ripped off from the uh, last crusades. And there were a lot of other puzzles. A lot of fun in design meetings, quickly designing stuff. We worked out a process. We took development down to, to a few months from a year. And the way we did that is we had design meetings with artists in the design meetings, and they would sketch on paper what the actual game um, activity was. Each of these things was based on a story and a bunch of game activities. Uh, and so the programmers would start programming using the line drawings to be replaced by the color graphics that were in the pipeline as well. And there was a, a whole tracking system, database system that tracked every asset. It was the most organized thing you've ever seen in a, in a company, and it was, you know, it was a big deal. We managed it. So Lightspan builds these titles, gets them in the schools. It looks great. And we go public as a corporation in February of 2000. In March, the entire technology stock sector crashes. Mm. Even though I thought I was going to be a, um, you know, retire from Lightspan, uh, that didn't happen. Um, the stock market crashed and the stock crashed. I had left Lightspan in 90, early 99 to do a stint at a completely different thing where I was basically the CTO of save.com, S-A-V-E.com. I had invented a digital couponing system with a guy named Bruce Ettinger. And we had a million people using digital coupons. Um, and, you know, we, you know, we almost sold the company, but it didn't happen. So the 2000, early 2000 decade was a dark, dark time for me. Um, so I had done Lightspan. I had done Save.com. And I was looking for, I would come up with some business ideas on uh, online applications, like a proofing application called ZipProof that I launched. But I needed something to do. And I got hired by a company called Technic Digital Arts in two in 2003 to work on uh, games for mobile phones. This is well before the iPhone. We did a game called Spell Strike using the same maze drawing I had done for um, Pyramid of Perils. So it was a 3D maze, and it was an attempt to do a multiplayer game. We just didn't realize how terrible the phones were in terms of communications. So uh, Spell Strike sort of came out. We had a we had a chat program that you used to actually set the game up because you couldn't get chat into the game. It was just too little and all that. So Technic blew up. And in early 2004, I was approached by people at Lightspan who had a license to a game called Yo Mama. And they had someone who claimed to have the license, the, the trademark for that. And it was basically be a game about fat lovers fighting each other in a boxing ring. It was possibly the worst idea I've ever heard. So I decided I would do something better than that. And I came with the idea of using uh, a card game with Yo Mama jokes with point values on them. And you basically throw down an insult and they throw down an insult and whoever had the better insult would win. But you didn't know what the point value of that insult was until you played it, right? So we built a mobile game based on that. And then we go to Comic-Con in the summer of 2004 and we're walking around. I'm the CEO of this company called Bonus Mobile brilliant CTO called Sherry Corno and a couple of people from, you know, from Lightspan. And we see the Wayans brothers at the Topps booth, T-O-P-P-S, playing card booth. And they have a game called the Dozens. It's the same game. Dozens uh. is a, the vernacular. It has beautiful cards with point values that are Yo Mama insults. So everyone's looking at me like, Bill, we're fucked. And I go, no, we're not. We have a mobile game. Let's get the mobile rights to this. The Waynes are cool. Having the Waynes will be a big deal. So we built this incredible mobile game. This is like, this is like on 64 kilobyte and you know crappy phones. This game had animation. It had in-game chat, and, and and most importantly, it had an innovation uh, that was really big. We knew they were going to be printing up card decks. So we said, what if one of the cards in the card deck is instructions on how to get the game on your phone? So rather than having to rely on the carriers, which were curating titles through what they called the deck, so Singular and T-Mobile and AT&T and Verizon, they all had their own store for games, and it was very limited. We had it so that you could get the game by just texting a message to a number, and then it would push the game onto your phone. And we also did this game not only in Java, J2ME, which was the Java for phones, or Brew, which was the Verizon system, we had a version that ran on WAP, which is the mobile web crappy, but good enough. And that version had everything but the animation. It had beautiful graphics. It had in-game chat and all that. And then, since the game could be played as a four-card game or a 12-card game, you could play the four-card game where someone had nothing but text messaging. It had a text message version. I still have the spreadsheets of all the Yo Mama jokes compressed so they could put four of them into a um, 
hundred uh, 160 character text message. So Vissing was Sherry Kuno who produced it in the technology production, did a magnificent job. The artwork was the Wayans people, great artwork, great product. We did a booth at E3 uh, in the summer of uh, 2004. This was a magnificent product. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a, there's a convoluted story, but the investors in the company, uh, I could get myself in real trouble now. I could get myself in legal trouble now. But I would just say is venture capitalists were very interested in the company until they found out something about the investors. Let's just leave it at that. And that never happened. So the company, oh. basically, yeah, this, yeah, I, I can't tell this. I shouldn't say this on record because I could get Okay, sued. okay. But they found no that problem, there, no problem. there was a problem in the company related to someone the investors had brought in and a, a three-letter agency that starts with the letter S. Um, so that didn't happen. Uh, it was very depressing. So Sherry and I break off and we form a company called My New Mo, M-Y-N-U-M-O, as in My New Mobile. And we build a portal for artists to publish ringtones and wallpapers and short videos to mobile phones. We build a self-serve portal. You can create your own storefront to sell your own ringtones or your own wallpapers and stuff. And this is an interesting idea. So uh, in early 2007, we wanted to promote it. So we created a flash game called Free Paris Hilton. And this game, you basically are catapulting Paris Hilton on a cart out of jail. And if you do it successfully, she lands. It's great. And if you, uh, you know, in fact, uh, my wife did the Paris Hilton voice. It was really funny. So we're thinking about what to do next. And we know the iPhone's coming out. And I see a video. A, t a broadcast with Steve Bomber of Microsoft, and he's laughing about the iPhone. Eh, it's the most expensive phone in the world. Eh, da, 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 da. You know, it's a piece of junk. So I say, what if we did a whack-a-mole game with Steve Bomber? Now, the iPhone has no app store for a year. So we, it's a web-based product. So we build a web game called iWhack, where Steve Bomber pops out of holes and you tap him to, to score points. And we get that out the weekend the iPhone ships. So Sherry and I share credit for the very first iPhone game ever released. And that starts my numo. We get the rights to a name called Play, Play Screen. And from 2000, uh, you know, seven to you know, all the way to the end of 2010, we are sort of doing two things. We're funding the company by getting development deals. We do um, Rachel Ray cooking. We do a telecom app. We do a safety app called Watch Me Nine One. We do a bunch of apps for people that are basically uh, starting out with web-based apps and then moving to um, to native apps. We get we do games, but we also do games. We do game. We did a game that was in the first 500 games on the App Store. Uh, I did a deal where I negotiated with Kenny Rogers people, and we had a bunch of casino games based on Kenny Rogers, starting with the web, and eventually being regular games in the App Store. So we did, you know, uh, video poker, uh, blackjack, uh, Keno. You know, we did Kenny Rogers games. Um, the only story I can tell about that is that we had when when we had real native apps and we could do audio because the web back then, the web games back then couldn't do digital audio. We had the gambler as the music and Sony basically forced Kenny to take it out of the game because Sony didn't want it in there, even though we were willing to link to um, the gambler on the iTunes. So this goes on and we're just sort of just a struggling independent company doing games. We do some really cool stuff, Match 3D, a match free game in three dimensions. You can look up the videos for Match 3D. We do a game uh, called, I did a game on the web that eventually became um, a native game called Pigs of Poppin, where you have pigs on the field of different sizes and you feed them until they explode and they set up chain reactions. It's basically a nuclear chain reaction program with pigs exploding called Pigs of Poppin before it was Angry Birds. In that in fact, it was originally a web-based game in the very beginning of 2008. The App Store happens in the summer of 2008. Um, I find a group that wants to do a poker game tied to uh, Phil Ivey, the famous poker player, and I negotiate the rights to Phil Ivey Poker. At that point, we get investors who want to buy the company. So we sell all the game division of MyNumo to uh, an investor, and we take positions. I become the chief creative officer. Sherry becomes the chief technical officer. I have been CEO of PlayScreen. In PlayScreen, does exist for five years doing a bunch of games for the iPhone, um, including we end up specializing because Sherry had worked on the Real Money Casino in the AOL days. We end up specializing in casino games in the UK where we did um, something called uh, Casino Cash, which was an iPhone game approved by Apple only for the United Kingdom that was a real money gambling game with uh, slots, bingo, scratch off, scratch cards, uh, and uh, roulette. Uh, and so that's what Play Screen did. Um, but for whatever reason, Play Screen sort of folds out towards the end of 2015. 
2016, I ended up taking a position at the guy who bought the company's business software company running uh, as a CMO, chief marketing officer. And I come up with this product. One of the two lucks in my life, I they want to do a product for iPhone printing. And I find that printreliably.com was available as a domain. No one had grabbed it. So that becomes print reliably. They kind of fouled that up, but that's the side of the point. So, you know, here we are. I've done um, I've done Lightspan and all that. Sherry and I struggle for a year. We do a, we do a we have a VR company. We do an educational game for um, a company in Illinois that was kind of interesting. And then for whatever reason, both of us had worked briefly for James Cameron in 2000 at a project called Earthship TV. That's where we met. Earthship TV was James Cameron attempting to do a sort of a YouTube like thing, but with original science programming. Very advanced. I could spend hours talking about that, but we talked mm -hmm. to uh, his brother. And he says, because uh, we have this idea about doing um, casino games that are funded with advertising. And he says, no, 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 I'm doing this harbor project. I need you guys to come in, Bill, you're a physicist. I'm sure you're, you're, you're a great manager. So we worked for this company called Human Health for a number of years. And then um, after that, I leave Human Health and I take a position running, helping to run a game studio by a company called Rocket in Los Angeles in 2020. And um, I leave that uh, story in itself um, never really did much there because they never really got anything off the ground ever than uh, where Samantha, which was a PC uh, game. Um, and uh, I get hired at the very end of 2021 to be the director of Shiba Inu Games and produce Shiba Eternity. This was an interesting project. It's not a blockchain game, but it's done by the SHIB people. They wanted to do a game that competed against Hearthstone and they wanted it out in a year. And they had a studio in Australia called Playside that was very um, good people who really wanted to get it done. And I did it. I, I basically acted as an advisor and a director. I wasn't so much designing the game as talking with designers and were coming up with things. And so we shipped this game in a year and it got better ratings in Hearthstone and it took a year to come out. And it got like, it was number one in card games for a while on the iPhone. And that ended... And since then, what I did is I had my own, I did the climate trail, I guess, when I was at Human Health, the other company, I, I decided to do a climate game all by myself. And that was the first game I had programmed myself in, in decades. And the climate trail uh, was is a giveaway. It contains a climate ebook and it's a game based on the Oregon Trail. And it was covered by the Weather Channel. I got on national TV on the Weather Channel. And I did it mainly basically because I was tired about arguing with, about, with climate deniers. And I figured if I did a game that was a post-apocalyptic climate game, modeled after the Oregon Trail, it might get some traction. And it did. It was, a, it, it, you know, it's got hundreds of thousands of downloads, I think, total. And the Weather Channel had me on TV, whoop, 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 my five minutes of fame. <laughs> um, and and I, I think I'm going to go back to it. But then I also, when I was at Aegis, we did a game called Crickler, which traditionally enough was done by Michael Crick, whose dad was Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for co-discovering DNA. So Michael had this rolled out crossword game, um, and it was interesting because you had sentences with words missing. And as you filled in the letters in one sentence, it, you know, letters would propagate to other sentences. It was like a rolled out crossword puzzle. And he'd been doing it for years. Crickler.com, C-R-I-C-K-L-E-R.com is still running. You can play the game on the web. But Crickler was interesting as a mobile game because it had really good retention. So I get asked to consult with someone, just meet this guy called uh, David Kay, whose father was the founder of K-Pro Computers. And he's basically replicating famous popular word games and trying to figure out how to market them. So he has a game that's similar to a game called Wordscapes. Wordscapes is the best-selling word game on iPhone. It has a circle of letters, and you swipe the letters to solve anagrams, and there's a grid of, on the screen where you fill in what possible words could be found. They're wanting you to find specific words, and you just keep finding anagrams, unanagramming, the, 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 you know, unscrambling the letters to find the words. And I thought about Crickler, and I realized that Crickler problem was that people had to use a typing interface on the on the phone, and no one likes a typing interface. But Crickler had amazing retention, like the best retention of the game I've ever saw. So I got, and, I got yeah, the idea. Uh, mind if I interrupt uh, right there, because retention is a key vocabulary point here, which changes uh, quite dramatically everything that you've done so far, because... Uh, at Activision, even with CD-ROM and uh, and Floppy, you're still selling at retail. Uh, I mean, then you move to what? Yeah, that'll change. And damn Apple for not having the the base price of games be ninety nine cents. If Apple had set the base price of everything on their store to be ninety nine cents instead of zero, we never would have had this happen. But you know what happened? 
Yes, uh, I remember it well. I mean, the, the chaos that ensued with, oh, the game will go free for 24 hours so that it moves up the charts and then pr a price will come back in. And then it just kept um, evolving at an people, enormous people, people place. have two versions of the game. They have a free version and then you get the paid version. We used to call it the premium version. Before they added in-app purchases in 2009, people were basically creating game demos as the free version that let you then play that and then you'd go to the paid version. But in-app purchases changed everything. Like I said, that game I did controller for Avalon Hill in 1982 sold for $25. Now we do games that cost us millions to produce, uh, some cases, or, or not, but we depend on people buying in-game things. So, for example, King, which did Candy Crush, which is the most successful free-to-play game, they hired psychiatrists who are familiar with uh, compulsive, comp compulsive obsessive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction. And they build that game to basically get those people to be the whales, to pay a lot of money to play the game. Most people don't pay any money. My, my wife plays Russell. She never pays a, spends a cent on it. She just plays it and it just throws lots of ads at her. Um, when we did, we had a game that was in development before we were purchased uh, at a play screen called Bocce Ball that we were doing for a Bocce Ball company. When we got purchased, I went to the bocce ball people and said, hey, can we be the publisher of that? We'll keep your ad in for your bocce ball set, but we'll publish bocce ball called, you know, um, you know. So he said, sure. And when we put that game out, it hit number one in Italy organically. And it was right there with, with Angry Birds on the place on the uh, U.S. market. But the problem was we depended on ads and the ad companies basically, you know, they were just fictitious about what we could expect in terms of revenue, particularly in Europe. In Europe, we got literally one one hundred of the ECPM uh, that they said we would get. So even though the game was successful and had millions of downloads, um, Bocce Ball's most successful title, Play Screen, ever did in terms of downloads. It didn't make much money uh, because the ad money wasn't really there at that point. That did improve. Um, you can do games that are hyper casual and be ad supported. But now we're in a model where everyone went to IAP it's so like Crickler, basically, the model for Crickler was you could play a game for free every day, but if you wanted to play more, you had to buy buy uh, you know tickets for it. Or if you did a game and you bragged about it on Facebook, we'd give you uh, you know, we'd give you currency, you know. So everyone was doing all these currency things. Um, when I did the game that I'm talking about with the, the that married um, trivia with um, the uh, descrambling letters, the anagram thing. I decided to do a subscription model. I'd have puzzles that were free all the time. I'd have a free puzzle every day, like Wordle did, but I'd make it so that there are a lot of puzzles you could play if you subscribed, and I did a subscription model because I think subscription models are the next trend uh, in gaming. And I think I'm not alone in that. I think a lot of a lot of PC games have gone to subscription. A lot of multiplayer stuff has gone to subscription. So I think that's where we're going. But the um, in-game currency thing, the in-app purpose of game currency and all that, it's interesting. And on the blockchain side, uh, people are trying to do games where players earn money. That's very difficult. Um, uh, there's a lot of theories about that. People initially, the way they did that is they went the NFT route. But as you know, the market for NFTs has collapsed. So my thinking is the model that's going to work is tournaments. Um, I, When I was at Rocket, that company I mentioned in Los Angeles, they brought me in to build a tournament rummy game for India, um, which never happened. I'm not going to go into why, but it never happened. But in India, Rummy is played as a real money game with real currency, uh, and it's a billion-dollar U.S. market. Um, they consider it to be a game of skill. So there are people doing skill games in the United States. There are skills and other people. But I think what's going to happen with blockchain is that it's going to evolve to be an esports model, you know, because um, – and you just need a currency that, that's very cheap to transact. Not, the current, not all the current currencies are, but there are some new ones that are – where the cost of transactions is subfractional pennies. And at that point, you can do tournaments and stuff like that and get people interested in playing games against other people and for money and stuff, you know, basically, you know, that are not gambling, but really skill based games. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, by the way, I, I consulted with a company called Rewardify uh, that does a match free game on the uh, iPhone, where as you win, you get tickets and you can enter a raffle for real money. They don't make you pay. Um, I don't want to say too much about what I did for them, but I got them through the App Store. I got them approved by Apple. And it should be said that the App Store itself can be a source of great pain. 
I've had games that were rejected by both app stores that did not violate a single rule. And most of the time, those games were comedic games, games that had comic themes. Um, if they don't, they don't like the co the comedy. They don't think it's funny, or they think it's kind of uh, insulting. They won't. They won't let you publish it. Now, um, interesting. You, uh, you've talked a lot about the Apple uh, Apple i Store. Now, uh, the App Store. Now, obviously, well, not obviously, but Android has a much larger percentage of the market. You make less. Uh, you make less money on Android. Just exactly. I was I was about to ask. I mean, you don't make it up in the volume, right? No. But Android is a good market if you just do good ad supported stuff. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I release titles on Android. Um, curiously enough, uh, statistic for you: there are more climate deniers percentage wise on Android than there are on iPhone. <laughs> the, the ratings for Comet Trail are much better on the iPhone than they are on Android because a lot of people on Android say this is this is a bull blown. This is a bullshit theory and this is a conspiracy blah 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 but no and apple people are more more kind to the title um yeah so um, interesting yeah just a weird um sort of weird statistic so um yeah um so yes you make less money in android um now the other platforms uh steam uh rocket produced a really good puzzle platform called where samantha beautiful title beautiful music beautiful i found the the, the narrator for it Fantastic title on Steam, but puzzle platformers on Steam are, are are saturated. You can't, you know, everyone looked at Where's Thomas and thought that was a great idea. Look, Where Thomas did all this money. The industry and venture capital too are like six year olds playing soccer. If you ever seen six year olds play soccer, wherever the ball is, everyone runs to the ball. No one thinks about where the ball is going. They just run <laughs> to where the ball is. And so gamers do the same thing. And um, you know, okay, Anagram Quest, not a hit. But my God, at least I tried to do something different. I took the best word game in the world in terms of revenue and popularity wordscapes, and I married it to trivia. So rather than having multiple choice trivia like Trivia Crack, which is the most number one trivia game, in Anagram Quest, you're presented with an anagram that's either the answer to a question or the, the word that's missing in a sentence. And you solve the anagram and you solve that question, you go on to the next one. So we just recently did... Pumpkin Spice Day. We did a puzzle about the Saw movie series. We do puzzles on uh, for like uh, bands. Like we did a puzzle about Jimmy Buffett music when Jimmy Buffett passed away. You know, you know, trivia about him. And it's all anagrams. At least we're trying to do something different. And once again, the publisher is Old School, which is run by Rebecca Heineman, who was the VCS programmer, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred programmer yeah. at Avalon Hill. So it's a full circle. Um, yeah. Now. What is the role of the publisher nowadays? For example, when you guys, when Activision picked up Manhole, uh, you guys asked for some additional artwork. Uh, you paid for the CD-ROM music. You you bought. Uh, I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You paid for the box. You yeah, paid oh, yeah. for the advertisement yeah. and so forth. What does the publisher? What's the role of the publisher nowadays in this digital environment? Well, it's, it depends on the publisher. Some publishers are very hands-off. The old school is very hands-off with me. I always ask them what they think and stuff, and they'll give me opinions, but they never push me hard on anything other than the fact that we need more downloads, we need more money, come on. But um, and, and in a nice way. They know that we need, we're need. we growing, but we're growing slowly. Um, but they never really push me. But I've, uh, I know, I've been at publishers where we basically designed and managed a project. We, the, the team that was building was more like a development team, like... Uh, but usually, like, like okay, let's take Playside and um, and Ship Attorney. Uh, they, you know, I we collaborated on design. I was a co-designer. I didn't design it. I created, I I did things like um, I created a spreadsheet that auto-generated cards, for example. That you know did the math and ran a number generation so you could so you could define the properties of cards and stuff. You know, you know stuff like that. And and we mm. would talk about design and we look at we we went we spent a lot of time looking at other products which everyone should do, you know? One rule I have at companies is your competition is not lame. People have products out there that are successful. You can't, I hate when people at a company say, oh, that's a lame product. It doesn't do this and that. No, no, they're great products. They're out there. They're making money. You haven't been launched yet. You need to treat them with respect. So we had high respect for Hearthstone and Magic the Gathering, and we studied them extensively. Came up with, I think, a better monetization model in many ways. So we have the same monetization everyone does. You can buy card decks, right? in a ship of eternity. We never limit your play. There's no energy model. You can play as much as you want. But we also came up with this model that when you win a match, you get a box that has your stuff in it. 
and it unlocks over time. But if you're impatient, you can spend your currency, which is kibble, and unlock it sooner. I didn't come up with that. Playside come up with that. They took it from another game, but they didn't invent it. They found another game that had it. So it was a collaborative process. So that's a, that's the best process, I think, to work as a publisher, where you're you're collaborating with um, with um, the developers, and you're uh, you know, I just found something, and um, you're making it happen. Let's see if I can get this out of here. I did. Da, 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 da. There it is. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, the manhole plaque. By the way, when the manhole came out, I sent that plaque to the CDI people as a joke. <laughs> I, did. I did, I did, I did. Oh, and I have our box game boxes, but don't worry about it. You can find that stuff online. That that disc is set. Yeah. Oh so no, anyway, definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I. So, um, is there a place for premium games? I think so. I think if you do a game and decide you're going to sell for four dollars, do it. I mean, you, you got nothing to lose. I mean, the. Uh, I mean, it's um, it's a tough world out there, you know. You, you have to make decisions. Um, I'm also a huge fan of educational games. I wish I could do more of them. That's what I did with Climate Trail. I made it. Okay, one final flub. Uh, we lost about 20 minutes of our recording. Some great conversation there. So at this point, we're going back into it, trying to recap some of the things that we had talked about during those 20 minutes so i apologize if a few of the comments seem like uh they are yeah a little bit canned or making references to things who aren't that aren't here anymore really really sorry not hopefully you've been at the, on the channel before and you know this isn't the typical if this is your first time congratulations you're seeing me on my best day okay so Back. Premium games on mobile. I, there are people succeeding in premium games on mobile. Apple even will tell you what the best-selling premium games are, but it's a small segment of the uh, money. Um, and I think the way that premium games can work on the App Store is if you have a license or something that's so valuable. I'm sure uh, uh, the pre the mobile version of um, Call of Duty is not free. I hope it's not free. I haven't checked it lately, but someone should. Uh, and uh, well, if I go like uh, I can go after here, I go uh, uh, cash if I go, you know, uh, Call of Duty, yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure there's a free to play version of it because it's can't be, yeah. uh, it's probably just like uh, Fortnite and um. And all these other massive uh, World, of Tanks, World of Tanks Blitz, World of Tanks Blitz, 3D multiplayer shooter on the Mac. Um, it's uh, it's got in game in app purchases. Yeah, people. Yeah, and one review says, "I have no idea why people keep calling this a play a pay to win game." Um, yeah, so, you know the point is that the, you know there's like, and I, I don't see Call of Duty, well, War Ops, you know, Dawn of Dead War Two. Yeah, oh, here I have Call of Duty. Yeah. Which one? The, 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 I don't know if you've seen these ads where they have uh, semi-dressed women fighting World War II. Have you seen this on TikTok? No. Uh, yeah, you can go look up worst mobile game ads. Uh, there's this whole this company that advertises like crazy. Um, there are a lot of people doing making money on mobile but just jamming the advertisements like mad. Like there's a game where you where you basically rescue a uh, king. Who's in danger? Uh, there's like something's going to pour on him or whatever. That game appears as an ad in so many mobile games, and 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 those people are just they're making a little bit of. That's why everything I had to explain. Infinity is that um, premium or not? If you're if you're running a ton of ads like this particular King's game is running, uh, you're you're only uh, you're not making money unless you're making very little money net for uh, downloads because you're spending so much money on um, on uh, you know advertising so let's see if I could find in my notes um, let's see if I F King no here maybe because okay. this is you know this is what's happening people are spending a fortune Well, this is what you would call um, a user acquisition or client acquisition, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so people are basically, um, you know, uh, they're spending a fortune uh, on advertising and stuff to get, and so their net's small. And so if you 
if you go on TikTok, you'll see crazy ads. You'll see, or, or YouTube, where you see like a lot of YouTube pre pre roll ads for videos. Naked, you know, semi-dressed woman shooting at shooting enemy troops in World War II, and yet I hear the game is nothing like that, and there's a lot of that. Um, so uh, you know, it's just just weird, you know. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So premium premium mobile is possible, but it's unlikely, and I think the only way it's going to work is if, let's say, you had a very successful title on a console or a PC, and you took it to mobile, and it was never a free-to-play model on those platforms. You might get away with it. Um, as a premium game, there are premium games. I mean, if you go to the App Store, you can say what are the best uh, top uh, top paid apps on you know top paid games. So you search for games. Well, I mean, Apple even went so far as they have their own subscription service for games right, yeah, that okay, have no okay. in-app purchases. Right, and that's not bad. That makes sense if you can get into that, you know. Um, so you know, uh, yeah. But you're right. You probably need to actually uh, recoup your development costs on another platform first before porting it over. Well, not, not that you need to be well, like so. Like for example, so I'm looking at the app store on the Mac. There's top paid apps, right? So if I see one of the top paid apps, um, let, me see, let me see if I can find categories. You know, and Apple used to be different. You used to have a, a chart. You used to go to Apple and you'd see the chart of what's doing best, and that ended. Okay, top paid games. <laughs> So the top paid games on, on Mac, uh, Asphalt 9, Legends, um, Township. Oh, wow, I know the guy who does that. Um, there's a company, by the way, called um, Handy Games. That's probably the best, I think one of the best run companies that does both premium and free-to-play games. They're brilliantly run. Uh, they start out life by doing a game called Townsman on feature phones in the early 2000 decade. And they kept that, that um, that sh that brand going on and on and on, and they they do stuff for all the consoles. They do stuff for VR. They every new platform that comes out, I, you know, they the handy game supports. Is this a handy game game? So, uh, oh, so here's a game that's premium and it has in-app purchases. How do you like that? Oh, that's not, yeah, that's not them. Um, so top paid app. That's... There you go. Civilization. Civilization's a top paid app. Civilization for the Mac is available for sixty dollars. God bless them. Sixty bucks for Civilization. Six Civilization six, and that's um, published by Aspire Media, which probably took it over from uh, the original publisher. Um, Resident Evil Village for Mac, The Sims, thirty dollars. Blooms, ten dollars. Um, uh, let me see what else. Jackbox, Jackbox Party. Ah, oh, there's a brilliant company. You don't know Jack. They're with the game. You don't know Jack. Yeah, yeah. They're still around. Yeah, yeah. They they still are. Jackbox Party Pack free is from Jackbox Games. It's twenty five dollars, and it's stuff like and they do they take in the uh, you don't know Jack franchise. Now it's interesting. I actually did a game. When my game in 2004, end of 2004, a game designed that myself and Sherry worked on together, got rejected by Apple and Google, we had this engine for doing a game where you have a picture and you have to guess what that picture is. Um, so I came up with a game that actually was featured by Apple, uh, was ad-supported free-to-play game called Stick Figure Movie Trivia. Uh, it was actually featured by, it actually did pretty well in its own day. And what it was is I got someone to draw stick figure scenes of various scenes from movies. Like the 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 icon for the game was a shark swimming up to catch the woman in Jaws, the famous Jaws poster. So the you know, and you, and I we did over hundred movies. Now I got the rights that back. And so have you played? Uh, you don't know Jack? Yes. Yes. Remember Jack Attack? Uh, I've, it's been a, it's been a, about twenty oh, years. So. All these answers come floating up on the screen. You've got to tap it. You've got to push the button when the right one comes. Yeah. I'm thinking of marrying Jack Attack to to the stick figure movie trivia game and making a no typing, uh, hyper casual trivia game where all you have to do is wait to the answer that's correct to tap, and if, the longer you take to get the right answer, the lower your score is. So it starts out with you know, if you get it wrong, the score goes to zero. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So there's. Uh, one of the games missed this thirty dollars. Missed the, the game that Activision lost. Um, wow. Limbo, which I think is uh, one of the great puzzle platforms that are on Steam, uh, is ten dollars. Um, Abe's okay. uh, 
Uh, catfishing simulator, five dollars. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I saw here Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and Vice City are six bucks each. Yeah. Jackbox Party Pack 8, $30. Uh, mm. Baldur's Gate 2. Oh, my God, there's an old game. $20. Um, wow. Yeah. Disco Elysium, the final cut, $40. Now, these are Mac games, but they're probably also Return to Monkey Island. Ah, oh, $25. Money well spent. Um, yeah, that's true. Monkey Island is my favorite adventure game of that era of the. Uh, oh yeah, the uh, late early nineties. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, here's an interesting one: balloons, and th and this is a topic uh, because balloons, um, uh, tower defense six, uh, on iOS is six ninety nine. But that yeah. same game is also included in Netflix. So if you're a Netflix uh, subscriber, you can get it basically included in your subscription through Netflix. That's good. Well, you know, more power to them. They, yeah. They, they probably don't see a crossover between the two, you know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because, I mean, it's uh, that model. And uh, and you mentioned earlier that you see the future in subscriptions. Right. Uh, do you think that subscriptions to individual apps is a is more likely to succeed, or does it have to go through some kind of hub, well, like a Netflix a or Amazon Prime? You a hub, your download revenue is going to be very low. You, 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 uh, in the hubs, you're probably making pennies per uh, player. You know, there's no way around that, right? Uh, that's the case. But um, if you do it in the game, the rule has to be, if you're going to do subscriptions in the game, you better have new content. I, I You know, the reason I, I did subscriptions for Anagram Quest is because Anagram Quest has new stuff every day. And that some of that stuff is free and some of the stuff isn't. Um, in fact, when it's free for a day, then it moves into a, a paid category, right? So if you missed uh, playing... Uh, the Saw movie, Saw movie, uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a model that makes sense. I know someone has a math game where there's new math puzzles every day. I think if you have a game where you have continual content flowing in, subscription works. That's not the same model as the Netflix model. The Netflix model is, I have a game out there, you know, Netflix isn't really going to be competing against my App Store stuff, so I'm just going to let Netflix sell and I'll get whatever they pay me and I'll be happy with it, you know. Uh, what would be cool? Is it one thing I almost penned this article called Freedom of Expression in Games when I got rejected? And I decided not to because I knew it would piss off Apple forever. Because what I basically said is I can do movies on any subject I want, I can do completely farcical comedy stuff. Uh, but I couldn't, you know, you can never do that in games because you might offend someone. And even though you didn't do any nudity or foul language and all that, if the reviewer thinks it's upsetting, it's good enough. Uh, well, if we were off recording, I'll tell you what the game is, but not, not on a recording. I don't want to piss off out. But I wrote this whole big piece, and here's how crazy it was. So Apple rejected us. I figured, okay, maybe Android will accept it. The guy who ran Android uh, App Store approvals, or ran the App Store, was not only a friend of mine on Facebook, he was a friend of my brother's and a student of my brother's in law school. So I figured, okay, we'll get this approved by Android. No, no. First they said... Can you prove you have rights to these pictures? Because they're pictures of well, they're the pictures that need rights. I go, yes, we have signed off on the people, and they like those pictures, and they want us to do this game. They sign off on it and all that, and he goes, ah, it's no, we can't do it. And it was it was at a time when something was going on in the industry that probably made people very um, uh, shy of doing anything that could be controversial. But like for example, if I want to do a you like, well, there's a game called. I don't know how this game got approved by Apple, but there's a game called Dump Trump, which is a takeoff on Flappy Bird. You know Flappy Bird is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dump Trump is Flappy Bird, except what happens is the bird gets through the maze and he poops on Trump. And that <laughs> game, game got approved by Apple. How? I don't know. I mean, they we did stuff that wasn't even close to that nasty. And a game I did early on in the iPhone store called Bail Out Bonanza. So Bail Out Bonanza was, you ever seen the game, Atari game Kaboom? Yeah. Yeah. So in Kaboom, there's a, a robber, a guy uh, in a prison suit going back and forth in the building. And he's dropping bombs. You have to catch them, you know, with your buckets of water, right? So yeah. we did Bail Bonanza, and in this case, it's a banker on top of the uh, 
stock exchange building, going backwards and forwards and dropping bags of money that you have to cash in buckets. Uh, and occasionally he throws a shoe at you and you have to avoid the shoe. And this is right after the George Bush uh, shoe incident. Well, that game took months to get approved by Apple um, because they were they thought the shoe thing was uh, offensive. And also because uh, we were making fun of the uh, stock, the, the equity crash of 2008. Uh, this is right around 2008. And um, we also wanted to donate money to uh, Feeding America. And they had a policy about that, that you couldn't say in the game you're donating X to, the, to, the, to a charity. You wouldn't let that. So that game was held up by months. I actually appealed to a shareholder at Apple to actually talk to management about that. And I think the only reason we got that approved is they remembered us from IWAC. But we, you know, uh, even back, even IWAC now might not be approved because we're making fun of Steve Bomber and making fun of the iPhone. I mean, if I did IWAC again, I'd have Bomber's video playing before the game where he laughs at the iPhone, and then I'd drop you into the game and I'd have all sorts of sound effects and better production values. The game on mobile on the uh, mobile web, 4.0 web, was um, very was crude. There was no sound effects. I couldn't get sound to work in real time back then. Uh, but it's a, it's a whack-a-mole game, you know, and, you know, that might not be approved now. You, you know, the fact that you can't do free expression games is a is an issue with the app stores. And a lot of people say, I mean, it's so what? You know, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter, you know. Um, oh, like, uh, there's a, you know, if you want to do a game about a controversial subject, like Apple has a movie out, a TV show that's excellent called Extrapolations. Have you heard of this? No. They have a series about extrapolations, and it starts like in 2030-something, and it's basically keeps jumping ahead in time as the climate gets worse and worse. Uh, it's it's a, it's I tell people like it's not the worst case scenario, but it's a probable scenario and it's pretty awful. Um, but it, it ends on a good note in a way. Um, but it's pretty scary and awful. You know, um, you know, if you did a game that was that dark, would they approve it? I don't know. I mean, um, the climate trail was no problem because the climate trail simply is. Oregon, it was an easy idea. You know, you take the Oregon Trail, but instead of having people going west to the Sentinel, you have people leaving Atlanta to go to Canada to evade, to avoid the comic apocalypse. They encounter hazards. They can even get dysentery. Um, uh, they, you know, they find, they, there's a hidden object game when you go to a town to find food, you know. You go to an abandoned store. This is a low-budget affair. I did this myself. I think I spent a few thousand dollars in artwork and music. Uh, George Sanger did the music on that by the Fat Man guy did the music on that. Very dark music. And the game is styled from uh, The Road and from uh, um, um, I, I am not moved to show with the, the guy who has is somewhat blind and he has a, and he has a Bible with him. Anyway, it's, it's oh, styled uh, Book of Eli. Yes, it's styled on Book of Eli and, and, the, and the Road um, in terms of stylistic the characters are interesting mix of characters. The scientist, a young girl, an ex-army guy. Uh, there are characters you meet on the way. If you're kind to people, it pays off. I mean, there's a there's a hidden thing where it's paid off if you if you help someone out later on. He, he gives you something that you can't find very easily and gives you a lot of it. He's just out of food, but he has something else you need a lot of it. So you give him some food. You know, I did I did all that stuff. And there, every time you go to a town, there's a little history of the town. Then there's a complete ebook. Here's an interesting story. The ebook in the climate trail is from climatecommunication.org. I went to Climate Reality Project, Al Gore's organization, and said, I have this game. It's out now. It's featured on the Weber channel. I'd like to put a climate ebook in there. I'd like to use your materials. And they said no. And the reason they said no is because they thought it was too negative. The climate trail, when it was released in 2019 and eventually updated in 2020 with the ebook, uh, predicted that there'd be massive fires that would screw everything up. There'd be diseases from things being released from being melted, and there'd be war over climate. Well, not all that's happened, but the fires did happen. And it was kind of like, don't make me do a book about a nuclear war because I don't want to be responsible for someone starting to set off atomic bombs elsewhere. Because that was too eerie. And they did this game, and suddenly the fires are happening everywhere. So it's kind of like, no, no, no. There's a book by Ursula K. Le Guin called The Lave of Heaven, and I don't want to be that guy in The Lave of Heaven. I don't want to be someone who thinks of something that happens bad. That would be really sad. But anyway... The point is, even Climate Reality Project didn't want to do something too negative. And I, but I applaud Apple for this series uh, extrapolations. They went negative, which is great. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> but the app stores are a pain in the, the app stores are a pain in the neck because they do limit expression. Um, people should be free to make. You know, I don't think you should allow pornographic games. Though there is a whole industry that does that. I don't know if you're aware of that. There's a whole pornographic. Oh game yeah. Web-based games. 
Um, but no, Apple can be, and, and there are things, but you know, that they restrict that are, you know, you don't want to have games that cause harm or anything like that. Um, but uh, it would be nice if you could do games about a topic that you care about, and, you know, uh, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of sad that these are gated communities. I mean, uh, Android's a little bit more open, but like you said earlier, uh, the Apple. the market's just not there. No, I mean, yeah, well, it, but Android, you know, here's where Android has a market. Well, I was born into Rocket, R-O-K-I-T, to launch a game in India. So India is all Android. Yeah. And they play a game called Rummy, which is a game where you play against people for real money, a Rummy game. And I was brought in to launch a Rummy game in India. And it was fascinating because there are people, shopkeepers in India, they're, they're, they spend a lot of time on their phones playing Rummy. And they're good and they make money. They, they are good enough to make money. I think that's no, that's actually a noble thing to have those games out there. Now, there are people who aren't good. That's, that's the case. But you know what people do for promotion? Brilliant. Rummy is a brilliant game because what you do to promote the game is you simply, instead of putting money into advertising, you put money into free tournaments. Every day you, do a, you spend X amount of dollars to have a tournament where everyone can enter for free and the winner gets X amount of cash. That's an advertisement without having an advertisement. That's, that's perfect. So there's a couple of companies in India. One one's based in San Diego. I mean San Francisco. I do very well with Rummy, and I spent a lot of time on this. I, I lined up the code and everything else, but once again, someone just didn't quite have the 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 um, withdrawal to do it. But that was a good education. And now I've been studying what's called the play to earn space in in the blockchain games, and most of them are, to be honest, crap. I mean, really bad. I mean, there, I'm not going to name a name, but there's a card game like a battle card game. That's very popular in the uh, free to play in the play to earn space where you pick the cards you're going to choose against the player you're playing against, and then the play game plays automatically. You make oh. notes once you play the cards. It's like, um, and so I did it. Obviously, I did Shiver Attorney. And one of the things I, I'm doing right now is convincing people that you're better than this, but don't. The problem with the play to earn games is that everyone based it on NFTs, and NFTs are in the. Um, toilet right now um it was eventually going to happen it was a matter of time sadly but uh there are a lot of things that could work in a space where people are competing against each other esports is is great and i knew esports was going to happen before anyone most people did because i went to korea to give a talk about the history of games in 2003 and i'm at what they call their cyber cafes pc bonds and i'm watching tv network tv of people playing um starcraft uh for in a tournament uh, like an esport and i said this is going to be huge and now you can go to the university of california san diego ucsd and they have a building devoted to esports really and, and they have scholarships for esports they have okay. academic they have sports scholarships for people playing esports so that is an interesting that now that's something maybe i didn't accept to have expect to happen either but when i went to korea in 2003 and saw it um that was a great talk, by the way. I gave a talk in Korea, and my last slide was awesome because I took the idea of ports of call and I said, "Imagine you have social games on that people can play that are running when you're not there, and you come back and check on them, and things happen economically." And that was Farmville, and I was saying that ports of call could be that. I said ports of call could be a game where multiple people are running shipping companies and stuff. And you send your ships out and you come back and check on them or you get a message. Your ship has arrived in, in uh, Montenegro, you know. And the point is, I wrote that and it was basically what eventually happened with Farmville. So I wasn't surprised, surprised by Farmville. Um, yeah. 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 You know what killed Facebook games, don't you? You know what killed the games on Facebook, right? Uh, I'm guessing that it was mobile. Mobile to some extent, but also because Facebook stopped people from basically spamming the world about their games. It used to be you could get a lot of users easy because people would spam, my cow needs feed, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that, that's true. That's true. That that was a uh, – yeah, now that you mentioned it, I remember them doing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that did kill it. I did one Facebook prop, property, uh, um, property when we were at uh, MyNemo called My Cat Personality, where you basically 
you you choose a cat that reflects your personality. You have different cat types. You just choose them, and it becomes something you have on your page about your cat personality, which is a stupid idea. But you know, we got a lot of crazy things. I when I did the uh, when we lost the Phil Ivey license for poker, we did play screen poker, and we would put I put up billboards on Interstate 15 going south from Vegas about um, uh, you know uh, what we called millionaire poker. We we had. We had billboards advertising our mobile poker game uh, on the way back from Vegas. We we did it. We put ads in airports. We did everything. If there isn't a marketing thing I haven't tried, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, probably have to get back into contests. I think contests are fun, you know. You you know offer a contest, you know, uh, first person to like I could once we have the scores working right, I'm gonna do thing where you have the first person to get a, a score of a uh, hundred on this puzzle and post shares it. Uh, with me gets a uh, gets uh, gets fifty dollars, you know, and see if people will do that, you know, something like that. Just try, try. You gotta try everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of insane how you have to keep innovating in the same game. So you cut. So if a player comes back to it six months later, they may not even really recognize it. Well, I don't, I don't think it's weird. Well, I did change the name, you know. Yeah. Well, this, this is another good question. I mentioned the print library story. So I have a marketing group I pay very little money to, and they do a very good job. They do the ASO for me and all that, and they do um, – they run campaigns. with there's, like a, there's a website that every six months we can run a campaign where we give something away, like we gave away free ads. Like we said, free IAP to turn off ads for this day only, and they'll drive thousands of downloads, and they don't charge anything, right? So this group comes to me and says, you know, anagram is what you are you should come up with a title that has anagram in it. And I go, okay. And so they come up with a bunch of titles, and, and I see Anagram Quest, and I go, hmm, is anagramquest.com available? It was. No one had it. So I grabbed Anagram Quest. That happened to me twice in my entire life. That and print reliably. You're doing an app for the iPhone that makes it easy for the iPhone to print to any printer, not just air print printers. And I come up with the name print reliably and printreliably.com, .net, .co. All that was available. That was a gift. That was a that gift. Yeah, it's sad that it didn't do a great of a job on it, but that was a gift. Uh, I, I actually know the guy named, uh, what's David Kremen? No, no, what's his name? No, I forgot his name. But I met the guy who had sex.com. Ooh. And he got sex.com before anyone grabbed it. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty cool story. Uh. <laughs> oh, million okay. Millions of dollars, millions of dollars. Oh, definitely. Okay, uh, we probably need to wrap this up. So I'm going to ask, uh, we have one standard question that we ask all of our uh, interview subjects here at the Time Machine, and that is, looking back at your career, what is one a development, one big change in the industry that you did not see coming that was huge? And what was one that you thought was going to be huge that just didn't go anywhere? Yeah. Well, the one that I didn't see coming was when Apple set the price in the app store to zero cents uh, and people started doing like two versions of the app. They did an app that was free and an app that was paid. Yeah, that was interesting. But when IAP happened and people went totally for the free-to-play model, which existed particularly in countries like China already, uh, and ov obviously with gold and games like Ultra Online, but the fact that it just took over, took over. I thought premium games would still be around. It's a pretty much dead desert in terms of premium games. So uh, I was, uh, yeah, a lot of people were taken surprised by um, by uh, free-to-play games and the whole free-to-play model. And like I said, companies like King and stuff, they hire psychiatrists. Uh, and I met the monetization guy at King, he's brilliant. Uh, to basically find ways of getting um, the obsessive players to really spend the money. So if you look at like the, the the distribution curve on who spends money in those games, most people spend no money in those games, but some people spend a lot of money in those games. The one I thought would be better than it was, uh, but it was quickly clear it wasn't going to be, was VR games. Um, yes, there are probably VR games people love, but I'm telling you, one of my problems is for somehow I was gifted with really good eyesight. I have 2015 vision and I'm old. Um, you know, um, you know, my first game shipped on cassette tape. So I have very good eyesight. When I play VR, there's a lag between my head movement and the scene movement, and it makes me nauseous. Now, I'm the kind of guy who can be on a sailboat in rough weather and never feel sick, or on an airplane in turbulence and never feel bothered by it. But you put me in a VR, like there's a 
product called called Rec Room. And Rec Room is great on mobile, but in VR, when you turn, they, they move you nine degrees at a time. <clears throat> I was sick for days, for days. So I have a, 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 a you know you know a, a Quest Two VR headset, and um, I can't use it. I just you know, and and yet there are good good game ideas. I mean. Um, I, I'm waiting for a Counter Strike that really feels good. And uh, you know, Counter Strike is the game I play on PC more than any PC game. I love Counter Strike, um, and I like I, I do like Fortnite. I think Fortnite's great, except the the shooting is just weird because it doesn't feel as accurate as uh, Counter Strike. But you know, Counter Strike I've been playing for what 20 years. If you get a good Counter Strike in VR, that'd be great. But it just it just makes you sick. Have you seen the Sphere in Vegas? The videos of the concert? yeah yeah I've seen that giant thing yeah. I know someone had a startup before COVID where they were doing something like that in games. You'd, you, you'd actually put on um, the polarizing glasses, you'd be in a spherical thing, and there'd be other people there, and you'd see them, but you'd all be doing a first-person shooter inside this spherical thing that displayed the graphics around you. And that was sort of where, now you look at the sphere in Vegas, the $3.2 billion uh, arena, and it's like, yeah, this is, this is, see, that doesn't make you sick. That's awesome. And uh, maybe one day that will be the way VR is. Um, Apple, will, AR is interesting. AR is really great. Um, though we had this phenomenon with Pokemon Go and didn't really catch fire. Uh, I've had AR game designs, but I never launched one. I had concepts for AR games, but I, I, I thought AR was cool. There's a, there's a video of uh, AR gone crazy where they talk about how far it could go. Um, you know, if you, wear, if you wore glasses that look like normal glasses and anything can appear anywhere... It could go crazy, but um, you know, AR could be good. Yeah, I mean, there's this new uh, website called Hey Go, or it's a new app, uh, and uh, it it will take video of you speaking, and then give you back a translated version with your voice speaking a foreign language, and the m mouth movements and everything are oh. synced to the new. But this is just something where you can upload it and it'll send it back to you. Now, if you could do that relatively real time, obviously because of language, it would have to have a slight delay. But if you could do that in AR, holy well, shit. I, I use translation programs when I travel. I, I, I have one. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I speak something and it says it. They're pretty good. Um, like I mentioned, the uh, I think the um, Rockstar people want to do the next, uh, you know, um, Sandbox game, whether it be uh, Grand Theft or Red, uh, Red, you know, Red Red Redemption, uh, the characters will be LM models, and I've seen demos of the following. I've seen demo where you can speak to a character, and they have a large language model behind it, and they talk back to you. Uh, there was this toy in Japan that went away for a while, but it, it was a, a, a glass cylinder, and there was a woman inside the cylinder, and she was your friend. Not only could you talk to her she would send you text messages during the day and, and you could respond to them. She was an AI. In a, in a, oh. so it was a big deal. I don't know if that's sold anymore, um, but that's that. And then I saw another demo at GDC where you could say a couple sentences and then the AI could make any speech sound like you. So if you had a recording, of, for example, of, uh, of uh, John Wayne saying something, you could have John Wayne speak anything. They could actually replicate his voice and have it say anything. That's why the writer strike happened. The writers had to basically do something to prevent themselves from being completely cut out. And it wasn't just writing; it was also speaking in in, in AI avatars. Well, um, there, yeah, the actors, the movies. There are some movies that the actors died and they finished them off with AI. You know. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, the we, a, the actors are still striking the the right. screenwriters, <laughs> and now there's. <laughs> Same reason, yeah. Yeah, and now it looks like the screen actors may also strike against the video game studios. Oh, but you know what happened? There's a huge development that people aren't aware of in the United States. The National Labor Board, have hmm. you heard about the change in the law? So the NRB has changed the rules that say if a company can be shown to have done bad things during a union process, like they basically pressured player people and all that and all that, then the union will be recognized without a vote. So they changed the NLB is just the biggest change in labor law since. That, I, I can't I can't say that that's a bad thing. No, I think just because it, it has to happen. It has to I happen. mean, 
Uh, they've gotten away yeah. with so much crap. I mean, alone the stories you've heard over about Walmart over the last 20 years are just so beyond the pale. Uh, and here I know some of my listeners hate it when I do politics on a video game podcast, but it's kind of unavoidable because we are dealing with something that's not only just heavily regulated, but also touches on every aspect of society. It sends out to people. I don't know if this is right side up or not. Yeah, no, it's right side up. Yep. So this is a this is a law firm that they they basically claim all these things about unions. They they basically go into game companies and prevent unionization. I got this from the pro union people at GDC as a as a mouse pad. So yeah, this stuff is going on all the time. Um, okay, so unions. Um, it's like, uh, Bill, why didn't you buy a Tesla? Well, the it's a joke, but basically, this is a funny story. So one of my dad's relatives, uh, like his great uncle, um, was the guy who was the head of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union for 30 years. Um, oh, wow. David Dubinsky. So that's funny, right? So I'm married to Leah, and Leah has a sister, uh, and his sister is married to Bob Dubin. And Bob's a major Republican. I mean, I have a picture of Bob and my sister-in-law and George and... Uh, and um, uh, Bush and Nancy. his white White House. Yeah. yeah. Oh, George, yeah. Later, George George W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Standing next to each other, they're buddies. So anyway, D- Bob Dubin at a party says to me, um, "You know, I'm I, you know I'm related to uh, this uh, labor guy named David Dubinsky." So I go, "Bob, we're cousins." So I'm, I'm cousins to my uh, brother-in-law. I didn't even know that. You know, uh, my family, my mom's family, is a politician family. Um, yeah. Mm. The, my mom is, I'm related to a mayor of New York, former mayor of New York from my mom. So uh, that's kind of funny. And he was, he was a Democrat, but he was kind of conservative. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, the digital game industry is, does treat people poorly. Um, and, you know, but, you know, I don't know how we solve the problem with uh, what happened. You can't complain about the industry being open to all the people who never played games before. When I was at Activision, we had a game called Shanghai. I don't know if you've seen yeah. it. It's like a Mahjong game. So yeah. I quickly learned that Shanghai was enormously successful. Very low, not high budget. The original programmer was Brody Lockhart, and he had been paralyzed in a gymnastic accident at Stanford. And he programmed that game with a stick in his mouth. Um, I have credits on Shanghai too, because I, they used the same color compression I did for eventually for all the other games they used it in, um, in Shanghai too. But anyway, Shanghai made money, always made money. And was on and the Paul Culler, who was the, uh, head of Activision Japan for a long time, used to joke that we licensed it to microwave oven companies. It was everywhere. It's a very simple game. It's a very good yeah. casual game. Remember, this is the 80s. And I said to Bruce Davis, I said, why don't we devote a bit of our budget to coming up with the next one? Because we're getting an audience here that we normally don't get. So I totally get casual games. I mean, uh, I thought Wordle was brilliant. Um, my brother, law professor, passed away in February. He played Wordle to the day he died. I mean, he loved that game. And, uh, you know, um, so, you know, uh, those games are great. And we Free to Play allowed us to bring in an audience we didn't have before. But it is unfortunate that you now have to live with the reality of um, games that make pennies per download. You just have to live with that. And you have to swallow your pride. We have digital distribution, so it doesn't happen. Now, when the consoles give up their drives... When you have a generation of consoles coming up that don't have any drive in them whatsoever, they have no hardware to drive, because I think that could happen, or it will happen. When it happens, everything will evolve, devolve to free-to-play. Because all it takes is a company to say, I'm going to do a game that's like X, but I'll make it free-to-play. And and even the majors the, might do that as well, you know? Um, yeah, so um, that's the truth, you know? Uh, yeah, and... Yeah. So yeah, free to play is here to stay, and uh, we have to live in. in fact, there's a book I have here, which is the premier book about this, by a guy I respect totally, um, Oscar Clark's uh, Games as a Service. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, it's a it's a true story, true book. I mean, we really are living in a world where games are games as a service. You know, um, you know, just like. Um, your your mobile app that you know uh, you know that you use for like I, I okay I have a an app I use called Strava Strava logs my bike rides right 
um, I pay a subscription to use Strava. It's a service. It does a lot. I don't have to do a subscription, but I do a subscription because I do a subscription. I get more, you know, and yeah. that's a, that's taken over the world. Now, um, like I said, I hope subscription wins over um, free, to, free to play. But for subscription to win, you have to really treat your game as a service and you have to be doing new stuff all the time. You know, it has to be new. You can't just have like, you know, uh, you know, whatever, you know. So Candy Crush would have to do new things. Uh, Wordscapes does a pretty good job of that, but they're not doing uh, subscription. They just do an AP and they do a, a model where if you want to play a lot, you have to spend. They're doing that sort of energy ish model where you basically are incentivized if you want to play a lot and spend money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But play to, free to, play to win is terrible. And I've seen that oh, in a yeah. couple. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I mean, like you said, they, they're bringing in psychiatrists and psychologists to figure out how to make the games as addictive as possible yes. at this point. And Skinner boxes, basically. A lot of these games are Skinner boxes. Yeah. Skinner boxes, yeah. In fact, what happens in Skinner boxes, the rat pushes the lever and a piece of food comes out. The way they get them addicted is they don't always give them a piece of food. You know, if by making the reward not always available, it becomes more addictive. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of dark. It makes you wish for the days when you went down to the store, you bought the damn box, well, and you yeah, called it have, a day. Do I have a controller here? Do I have a controller? And I have Voyager. I don't see my controller box. Oh. I mean, the controller box is gorgeous. If you look at Avalon Hill controller, that box is just freaking fantastic. Maybe I can. Can I chat? Here, wait. I think I, I. I think I just pulled it up here a little bit ago on Moby Games. I was looking at at your credits, and let's see, controller, and I'll have links to all this in the show notes for the listeners. Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, that is a beautiful. Oh, that's that that just smacks of 1970s. I mean, it's a perfect box. It's a perfect box. It's yeah. Exactly the same game. You know, like you're under pressure. Your air truck controller. Oh my god, the plane's gonna crash. You know, you kill people. Oh my god. Yeah. It's and and controller was like one of these things that just like you know I go into the, I'm working at this video store that rents videos and sells Atari computers and Osborns, and uh, <laughs> Frank made on the he wrote himself on his Atari computer and I. Uh, I said, yeah, we can make a game out of that. And, you know, I came up with this idea. You choose the number, the, the, the type of planes, the number of planes. They're all around. You have to get them all lined up on the runway. Keep them away from each other. Keep that separation. Got to keep them separated. And all the planes, <laughs> have, you know, how rate of climb, rate of descent, how fast they can turn, you know, uh, in terms of angles, you know, and all that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. No, yeah, fascinating stuff. And that was okay. a, that, funny, you know, not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's also a different uh, crowd of people playing games. I mean, if you were a computer what user, any audience. Yeah, if you were a computer user back then, it's probably because you were a hobbyist who also wanted to do some programming and stuff. I mean, the the generation that just bought the computer to use pre-made software that came with VisiCalc, and then later on the video games on machines like the C64 weren't quite there yet when controller came out yeah no yeah yeah the controller came out way before the c64 so there you go and uh, and yeah. uh it was interesting hypercard you know you think about hypercard and the mac uh you know 1985 86 or whatever when hypercard showed up 85 86 there were still people who wanted to build things on their computer by themselves and that's why hypercard was popular and so you don't see anything like that anymore well there is Swift Playgrounds on the iPad. So Apple has a thing called Swift. That's their new development system. And they have a version that you can use on the iPad. And it's mainly for education because people want to learn. Some people want to learn programming because they want to make a career out of it. You know, one of my children is a, a computer scientist um, who, by the way, went to undergrad where I went to grad school. So he went to UNH where I did my graduate work. He went to there as undergrad. And I'm still mad that he never went to his professor and say, you know, who my dad is. And he never did. He was he was too shy to do that. But when I went to his graduation, the professor was still there. The guy was there. Oh, really? God, cool. Picture him in the he's being uh, carried on like like a, a like a mosh pit by a bunch of kids in in the audience at the uh, graduation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bergeron, Professor Bergeron is being carried. And so this is my son graduated, I guess, in um, uh. 
2017 or something, 2008. Anyway, I forgot the exact date. But Bergeron and I last met in 1982. So he's still around. I was like, wow. Jeez. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my son didn't ever introduce me. But what's funny is my physics professor at Penn, the guy who did the uh, neutrino experiment in the home state gold mine, Landy, he told me that he brags about me all the time to his grandkids. You know, I, this guy was with me and he's, he became a vice president of Activision. He did all these games and all that stuff, you know. By the way, I, like I said, I owe Bobby a, a debt because Bobby kept me around. And also Bobby didn't kick us out for doing Love of Goddess to Phobos 2, which was a magnificent bomb. <laughs> you should see the answer, like, horrible. I, I mean, that transition, I, I got to ask about it just a little bit. That transition when Bobby came in, I mean, and what w was there any discernible criteria for who got to stay? Was there a lot of people getting fired or was it just a lot of people leaving? Well, see, what Activision did before Bobby came in that was wrong is they did the layoff of the week. You know, most companies, when they're faced with financial disaster, will basically do a massive layoff and then have a meeting with everyone left and say, OK, you guys are OK. We're going to get through this, blah, blah, blah. We're so sorry. They didn't do that. Um, um, they were like laying on people continuously. It was like a continuous layoff machine. And it was like dumb because a lot of people left. Like I had friends at Activision who just quit, who just quit. And then, of course, when they moved to Los Angeles, a lot of people just wouldn't move to Los Angeles. So, I mean, I was living in Palo Alto. You know, and finally I moved to, uh, you know, I moved to a good place. Don't get me wrong. I nailed a really nice place to live in. But um, a lot of people didn't stay. But, you know, uh, he, you know, Bobby was gracious, you know, to a lot of people. He was, a, I don't know if he's the same guy now, but he was very gracious about it. He was very nice. He didn't really lay off people. There were just very few people left when he took over. And then when he moved to L.A., very few people came with us. I think, was, like I said, 12 or 13 people. Kelly Zamak, my, who ended up being the producer of Lost Treasure in Hong Kong, myself. And then we brought people in. When we got to L.A., he hired people. He hired, uh, uh, you know, Eddie Dumbrower, who had done Earl Weaver, and he became the producer of Return to Zork, which was perfect. I worked on the technical side on the game engine and the, U, and the UI and the, and the video and audio drivers and all that. And with other people, I wasn't by myself. I had, to, I had people to work with me. And uh, Eddie handled the actors and the video recording, the audio recording, and the script writing with some with a, a guy who wrote the script. It was a perfect thing, and Bobby let us do that. It was a, a I think the budget was around seven hundred thousand dollars, which seems small now, but back then was a hefty budget. Yeah. Um, and, and considering all the actors, and they were all union actors, and so you know it was a big deal. Yeah. Um, uh, but like you know, the budget for the uh, card game was billions you know but not insane you know but it has to be it had to be good no of course i mean and there was a lot riding on it at that point yeah yeah um yeah. but it was yeah. a massive success i mean beyond zork <laughs> sold well yeah return yeah zork, zork bobby used to joke that you could put anything on a cd and sell it back then but the truth is return of zork was a good title and there were bundle deals uh and it, and it did well and it was well liked and the fact that if you go into uh youtube and quote return to zork unquote you'll find so many videos about it it's it's such a, a i always i always joke that i'm orson wells somewhat in reverse in the sense that yes return to zork is absolutely the best thing i ever worked on there's no question that nothing else i've worked on has been that important nothing pyramid of peril is loved by some people because it was an early mac game but it's not return to zork uh, but on the other hand, I reversed what Orson Welles did. I started out looking like Orson Welles, and I dropped 140 pounds, and and that was that. Um, you know, um, you can take a look at my YouTube, my Facebook, and you can see all the stuff and all that. I got, you know, I got into cycling in a big way. Like I, I still go on rides now, and I I track rides, and Strava will tell me, you just set eight personal records today on these particular segments of the road. And I go, I wasn't trying. I, I guess I I rode faster than I did before. You know, and this has been. Using Strava for over a decade and stuff, yeah, yeah. But I was on the cycling team in college, and I let myself go, and blah blah blah, ex jock type thing, and all that. But it's you know, and losing weight is very hard. Um, yes, keeping weight off is even harder. I have a blog about this on on Medium where I talk about how the odds are insane. Like a, f a five year weight loss retained is um, like three or four percent. Uh, Twenty five year weight loss? No, no, it's just. Yeah, and there's a reason why it's biology on it. There's a New York Times article on The Biggest Loser, the TV show The Biggest Loser. It does a really good job of explaining what happens biologically. Your mm -hmm. metabolism never comes back. It never comes back. You always be having to go deficit in order to maintain weight, no matter what you do. 
I've done 125 mile rides where I've not lost weight. So there you go. Yeah. So yeah, no, I totally but, understand. Yeah, but it's good, you know. I mean, I you know, I'm 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 more satisfied with my career now than it was 15 years ago, only because I realized how you know when I went into mobile in 2003, starting in 2003, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. So I, I give myself a break. I've had some good mobile titles. I have titles that were featured by Apple that were fun titles, you know, that gigantic success, successes. But Stick Creek Movie Trivia was a clever idea, and Word Carnival was nice, and uh, Pigs and Popping was fun, you know, and cool. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So it was nice, you know, and then Word, and I think Adam and Quest is a great game. I think this is a potentially huge game, but you got to get the word out, and that's the hard part, you know. Well, yeah. I think that this interview may help. So, okay. It's, a- it's it's getting late over here. I do have to call it a night, unfortunately. So where in Germany are you based? Uh, I'm in Halle. Uh, I'm that's... Here for the uh, for Gamescom. That was wild. Yeah, well, Gamescom, uh, I was at one of the earliest ones back when it was still in Leipzig. And yeah. then they moved it over to Frankfurt. Um, so I was there... Uh, 2003, I believe, or 2004. Remember, they were showing the. It was the first time anybody got hands on with Doom Three. Uh, yeah, it was impressive as hell. Although already at the time, he was like, "What do I need for a machine to run this thing?" Yeah, oh, I'm well, not gonna well, get that. We, when we were when I was at Activision, games would come out that wouldn't run on any machine we had. In yeah. 2000, in 1994, I remember Seventh Guest came out. And it wasn't a single machine in Activision could run that game. And you know what? That worked out fine. Everyone yeah. played the machine. It was curious. This afternoon, I actually watched an old episode of the Computer Chronicles. Oh, my God. I'm, they covered the uh, first macro show, and they show a screen from Pyramid Apparel, by the way. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, really? Okay, I'll got to check that out. No, uh, it was an episode from 1995 where they're showing just games. It was a games episode, and they were demoing MechWarrior 2. And, two took so long to come out. It was like, yeah, the Mech Warrior One's nineteen eighty. I wrote an article about that that haunts me to this day. I don't mention it, but the article is called "Why Can't Johnny Ship," and you can look for it. And I and it basically alluded to what happened with Mech Warrior Two about mentioning it. it. It was like basically like the opening of uh, Holy Grail. The team that sacked the team has been sacked. You know, we went through, uh, you know, two or three teams before we got that thing out. It wasn't all their fault. One was their fault. The other one wasn't. But it was a uh, a crazy game, and uh, the the opening video sequence in the original Mech Warrior Two was a video codec used in Return to Zorn. That I can tell you, that was kind of cool. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. The opening, yeah, same that codec that ran on the original DOS Mech Warrior Two. Um, wow. We're still building mech games. I know one guy is trying to do a turn-based mech game, which is a cool idea, actually. Uh, Infocom well, did well, Battle Battle Crescent's that- event. Yeah, um, yeah, it was the uh, the original oh. BattleTech license that was at Infocom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been to a BattleTech center. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah I I did that. Uh, they set up the BattleTech uh, machines every year at DragonCon. It's oh. a big convention in Atlanta. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I got to play on those a couple of times. That was fun. They used Amigas in those. Though. Actually, I don't. Know if they still did, but the original. No. Well, it, oh, they don't use the Amigas. Uh, no, uh, I don't. Anymore, I, anymore. It, no, they used Amigas partially for the virtuality, those yeah. old VR things in the arcades. <laughs> Mech Warrior Centers actually had both Amiga and PC at the same time on the machine. It was both machines together. P- Amiga used for oh. the graphics, PC used for the 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 the, uh, the instrument panel, something like that. Originally, the Mech Warrior game in 1993, 94, or something like that. Oh really? Oh, that's Mech- badass. Yeah, the mech centers. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh. I, I like uh, uh, you know uh, arcades like that. Uh, it'd be nice to have an arcade where you get into a fighter playing topic with the full screen. Like my son has that set up with the big screens and all that, and and the shift levers and the clutches and pedals. And you know how with PlayStation uh, Gran Turismo, which uh, I thought was fantastic when it came out and still is, um, real race drivers have been been. Um, uh, developed from that people who race real race cars have come from gran turismo well they just released a movie about it yeah called gran turismo yeah uh i mean this is the thing that games have the potential of doing that 
if they allow you to get immersed in it. Uh, and this is one of the, again, going back to the issue of, you know, microtransactions and whatever else, what it's hard to create that extremely immersive scenario in a game that has to constantly beg you for money. Like subscription might work to be the solution out of that mess. And the that's I, it. The other thing I'd say is this, the lockdown with the schools is a testimony to the failure of educational software. There was an error in the 80s and 90s where there was really good educational games brought up on, you know, uh, learning uh, company, company, um, uh, the, the people do math blaster. All that was cool. And, and Lightspeed was founded on that idea. Now there's just drill and kill crap. Um, I mean, you conceivably could build like, uh, there was one game we worked on, Sherry and I in uh, 2017 for the Indianapolis Charter School, where we took it, uh, we built in um, a, a sort of a role playing game where you're on a planet uh, and you basically have to find knowledge things in order to succeed. It's a crazy story. But the whole idea was, can we make an entertaining game that actually covers a subject? And the answer is yes. One example of this is a, a game called uh, Dragon Algebra. Brilliant game. So when the lockdown happens, there's no good stuff. Everything is, none of it's self-motivating. All of it's sort of awful drill and kill. And of course, it was a disaster for the kids to be away from the school for that long. It's a failure of the, of, well, there's a story about what happened to educational games. And a lot of it was um, corporate shit. It wasn't that educational games died because people didn't want to play them or want to buy them, but the uh, the uh, the corporation machinations of acquiring and all that, eventually these companies were, were whittled down to nothing and died. Um, uh, I, I view Anagram Quest as some of an educational game. You can do educational content, and I do. I have science questions and stuff like that. It wasn't, But that's not the main thrust, but I regret that um, the educational game market went away, just like, you know, Premium well, control. and this is a question. I mean, when you guys were doing uh, the games that were basically just being sold to schools, yeah, uh, you weren't doing uh, commer uh, any kind of commercial sales. What was the economic? What was the economic schools, model on that? Schools got box, got machines, and the this, and curriculum materials, and study guides, and you know, uh, you know, and all of that, and uh, lesson plans, and all that, and they paid thousands of dollars for that. Every school paid thousands of dollars to get that box and all that stuff. And they were happy to. Um, what happened is the schools used to have a, before mm, 2003, the schools, the, the government had, the federal government had something that schools that were doing poorly would get funding to, to do stuff like this. The, the federal government was funding schools that were un, underperforming with um, funds to do things like bringing computers or stuff. So that's what brought money into Lightspan. Then what happened was no child left behind, which basically was no educational software company left behind. Because what they did is they basically, no child left behind's philosophy was this. We're not putting any more wood on this fire until it burns hotter. Yeah. That's exactly what no child left behind was. It was a disaster. And then since then, the one thing that educational reform has in common of all these various things, they all suck. And nothing ever happens. Nothing ever gets better. But education sucks. If you want to watch a good video about education, the Michael Moore thing, when he Called who do they next? And he goes to Finland and looks at their educational system. It's eye opening because they they yeah. do a good they do a really good job. They don't do any homework. There's no homework, mm -hmm. no homework, and there's a reason why. And you watch the thing, and you go, yeah, that that they make it all self motivating. It's all self motivating. Well, let's if, face it. Any time that a politician sells you something as a reform, no, it's it's because they can't put the label improvement on it. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, um, like I, I try to be optimistic about the climate stuff. There's a huge, huge, huge developments in geothermal that are going on, one that's actually working, one that could be working. And I try to be optimistic about it. But the money that these guys get to run their campaigns, I mean, they are actually giving more subsidies to the energy, to the fossil fuel industry than they ever have in the history of, of subsidies. There's, yeah. There's the fossil fuel people and you know ah, no it's not what you do anyway we should probably end this because i think i should see my wife she's probably wondering where i am um, and i it's two o'clock in the morning here and i desperately need oh, to shit. sleep yeah you got to so <laughs> all right great talking to you this has been the best well, interview. This the, uh, thank you very much and this has been an extremely entertaining one for me and i i am very very thankful you yeah, gave me you're the time. Time i've ever been into who got the whole nintendo 
uh, Magnavox, Philips, uh, you know, CDI story. No one else knew, knows about that. Uh, I, I, we, uh, we did a whole extra episode just on the uh, the Magnavox lawsuits yeah. uh, with a guy who's done the research and. Uh, yeah, I- I have an extra wrinkle. I have an extra wrinkle on the story of uh, the uh, the Philips PlayStation Nintendo CD-ROM thing. Yeah. Uh, because I spoke briefly with one of the developers of the Seventh Guest. I know and, Graham Fine. Uh, it, I think it was Graham Fine. Yeah. And yeah. they picked up uh, Nintendo bought the exclusive console rights for that. That's why it never showed up on this on the 3DO or the uh, uh, or the Sega CD and so forth. But they picked up the rights for their CD-ROM drive, which they never did. But that's the thing. Here's my theory. This is my theory on it. They dumped a Sony because they realized in their original deal with Sony that Sony was allowed to manufacture their own standalone Super Nintendo compatible PlayStations. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. This was the problem. I, I this still, is still, also something has to this, do with this. The, the going to CDI was because of Magnavox. Oh no, 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 no. Okay, there's there's two things happening in parallel, and this is uh, my buddy Ethan, who, who's really, really deep into going through the old contracts and stuff. Yeah. He he is of the opinion that the giving the licenses to the characters was completely independent of the CD project. That was just to get Phillips off their back. Yeah, that's part of the settlement of the lawsuit. But, the but, but I still think the fact they went to CDI as their replacement for the Sony PlayStation. Uh, but see, they never did. No, that's the well, brilliant that's, part. That's no, no, no. They didn't even do it on a development standpoint. They had because a they had because a less than a year later, less than a year later, after the announcement, Nintendo holds a conference for software developers. Yeah. Giving and we have the document that they handed out that day. Yeah, the technical specs for the new Nintendo CD ROM. There is no CDI element at all included in it, and you can yeah. find the document online. The CDI is never actually, as far as I can tell, considered by Nintendo. And we do know from the PlayStation they prototype. They announced they were going to do the CDI. They did announce it. No, no. They announced it, but they never actually did anything with it. Yeah. I, I think they just did it so they could get out of the contract with Sony. Oh, okay. So that's a good, good point. But it was a piece of junk also. They looked at it. Oh, of course. Like- no, no. CDI was garbage. But have you seen the prototype for the PlayStation? The original PlayStation, I saw it in person in Japan in 1990. There you go. I saw the Nintendo Super Famicom PlayStation add-on in yeah. my last visit, my last meeting in Japan, 1990. Now wait, did you saw an add-on or a standalone device? So the add-on. Okay, because the, uh, there's also the standalone device, and that's the key. And this also was in the press releases. Sony had the right under the contract to make their own standalone combo device that would include both the CD player and a cartridge slot. Well, that was probably pretty tough for Nintendo, and that's why that probably makes sense. Yeah. That and and I think that once they realize that if Sony can mass produce Super Nintendos, they're going to muscle Nintendo right out of their own market. Yeah, you know, Console Wars does a good job of explaining what Sony did with the play, the real PlayStation. And oh they, yeah, they 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 snookered uh, Sega big time. They, they they kept Sega on a leash all the time. They kept bullshitting Kalinsky, and then they finally screwed him over. You know, but Kalinsky was pissed off at Sega anyway because Sega so bollocks the Saturn. Here's the point: Saturn ships. What's missing from it? Sonic, Gang. no Sonic. <laughs> well, Sonic too. Yeah. Well, Sonic is missing. But also, wait, but Kalinsky has also uh, screwed something up. And this is an accounting problem. Yeah, I'm just looking now, at the way. Yeah. Go ahead. So what Sega of Japan does a few, year, a few years earlier, around 87, 88, yeah. that they change their accounting standards so that they don't, they're no longer 
doing a calculation on a read uh, the for the whole corporation as one. Their bookkeeping in Japan is only the bookkeeping for Japan, which means that the money for the launch of the Genesis in the United States and the very big losses because they were selling everything in the states at a loss. Yes, like so that that was being uh, that was being put down on the books in Japan as an open account as an asset because they were going to get paid back by Sega of America. But at the same time, what was Sega of America doing with the money they were getting alone alone? They were buying inventory of cartridges and hardware from Sega of Japan. Oh, that's so true. Sega of Japan was double booking every console sale because they were also the financiers of those consoles. Hmm. And so what ends up happening is that Sega's big boom on the stock market, their big profits don't actually exist. The Genesis may have garnered a, gathered a lot of market power but this it was is, never profitable this is fraud this is like basically almost fraud them because what they're doing well but is this is the thing it's legal oh, yeah we made this money because now sake of america owes us all the money for the shit they we they exactly do. and the That's money's going to come back but this is and this is why when kalinsky suddenly says hey the Saturn's too early. We need the 32X. We have to keep the Genesis going. It's because he still knows he has to pay that money back. And Sega of Japan hasn't figured out that they're actually double booking and the sales numbers will never justify it. Well, also the Saturn was a piece of crap. I mean, Well, the really Saturn was a piece of crap, yeah. Uh, because, okay, You're Sega has one problem. Sega was always fighting the last war. Yeah. Uh, if you look at their first game console, the SG-1000, the yeah. predecessor to, this, uh, to the uh, Master System, yeah. it is basically an answer to the TI-99. And the Nintendo... Yeah. was a dumb freaking company. That's why Avalon Hill never did titles for it. You couldn't do titles for it. Exactly. And Nintendo is coming out with the NES... Which is which is handling sprites in an intelligent way and color separation in an intelligent way yeah. for the price, and Plus it's it coming in so low. Yeah, and the, and the and the fact that you look at you look at Donkey Kong Country on the uh, on the original NES, uh, Super NES. No, Donkey Kong Country on the original NES is magnificent. There is no Donkey. No, no, you're thinking regular Donkey Kong. No, I'm Donkey Kong. About, uh, the the sort of again. Well, anyway, the point is. Nintendo yeah. was Super Nintendo, right? Donkey Kong Country and Super Nintendo looks awesome. And mm. it was really a programming feat of excellence. It wasn't that the Super oh, Nintendo yeah. was powerful. And the same thing with that, uh, that 3D game that was done by the company in England, you know. Star Nintendo, Fox, yeah. Star, Nintendo always made it so that the cartridge themselves could be logic, have logic chips on it and, and be better. So, like, we would always, like, try to get that particular chip on our cartridge to do X, Y, and Z, you know. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I, I almost I negotiated with Kesmai, uh, who did a lot of the multiplayer stuff, to try to get a game on to um, the NES modem. NES was going to bring the modem to the United States. Mm. Modem in Japan was mainly used for stock trading, and I had been involved with Air Warrior. I knew the Kesmai people, and I was going to try to we were going to try to do like an uh, like an Air Warrior like game on uh, Nintendo uh, with the modem, and never happened. Uh, that's that's too bad. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of hype around that modem coming over, and it just never they they just decided not to do it. I mean, Sony Sega did something with a modem. I, I don't remember. What uh, yeah, Sega had the Sega Channel, which was uh, where you could download games over cable. Yeah, that was pretty cool. All right, we should get going because. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I could go on for a while. This this is actually fun. I'm enjoying this. Um, but yes. Uh, thanks again. And uh, I. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed another video game newsroom time machine interview. You can leave us comments on Twitter, Instagram, and if you like what we're doing here, drop us a couple of bucks on Patreon. All the links are in the description below.